Hello friends. Welcome to the Muse fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Namikaze Naruto fell in the dimensional void. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Hoshigaki Kisame was a man who was used to all things strange. He did after all carry a sentient weapon, look like a living walking shark, and was partnered to Uchiha Itachi. The last one alone was something he didn't find so strange however. Despite that, and being an S-rank missing nin of Karigakur, there were some moments when even he was found something that was weird even to him. He cited the large and creepy eyebrows that a certain ninja from Kanahagakur had on his forehead as a clear example. While few things could possibly rival that encounter in all fairness, Kisame believed he had found one. Standing on the desert plains of Kei's no Kuni the swordsman from Kiri found himself blinking several times to make sure his vision was not being clouded. The swordsman detested the unbearably hot and dry climate and absolutely loathed the occasional mirage he had come across. After blinking a final time Kisame was certain of one thing. Yo, Kisame mind explaining to me why we're in the middle of a desert. And where is your hot and sexy partner? There just had to be something wrong with the person standing before him. Kisame would have continued to stare at the figure were it not for the last question he had been asked. Uchiha Itachi, his certainly male partner, having been called, hot and sexy, by a random man made his mind freeze up in shock. My, hot and sexy partner, you say? Asked the swordsman as he looked down into a pair of bright blue eyes that were fairly familiar to him. Yeah, geez, Kisame you going deaf man. Oh wait I get it. A finger was raised up to him as the man put on an arrogant and knowing smirk. Your mind is still kind messed up after listening in on us that night at hotel in Nami no Kuni right? Can't blame you though old buddy. Your partner may seem like a willing mute at first glance, but as you heard that night, behind that wall of solid self-control is a screamer. Come to think about it, I'm surprised that I still have perfect hearing after that night. Huh, good times eh? Kisami's blue skin seemed to turn a lighter shade as he suddenly felt ill. While he certainly would have remembered any time Itachi got laid, the mental picture that found its way to him was most disturbing. As he shook away the disgusting thoughts from his mind, the Kiri swordsman looked down again and found the man nodding his head up and down sagely with both eyes closed. Don't worry my friend, don't you go worry at all. I remember that discussion we had. I still haven't put that particular encounter into any form of literature yet. And I won't until the day you die. The nodding stopped as the man glared daggers at Kisame who looked even more confused. But really, chasing me with Samahat out of that hotel seconds after we finished up and not giving me time to put something on. I mean I know you're very loyal to your partner and all, but was any of that actually necessary? A simple attempt at the whole overprotective brother speech wouldn't have worked as well for you. Pal, I know I should probably be one of the last people to say this but, are you some kind of crazy? Kisame deadpanned as the man finished. Surprisingly he soon dropped the glare and took on an exaggerated thinking pose, one arm draped across his chest while the other's hand cupped his chin and his eyes looking up to the sky. Now that you mention it, yeah, more or less, I'm fairly certain that I am at least partially insane. Why do you ask? You are aware that my partner, to my knowledge at least, prefers women to men right? Really? Oh, that just made all the sex even better. The man suddenly took out a notepad and red pen from nowhere. Now let's see how can turn that into literacy gold. Oh, how about, the audacious male lead discovers weeks after their passionate encounter that his most recent lover secretly preferred the comforts of supple female flesh, wait a minute. I still can't write this stuff down cause of you. You just had to go and reveal a tidbit of potential brilliance to me that I can't use, didn't you Kisame? That is just like you. Some biggest fan you are. Who are you? Exclaimed a somewhat freaked legendary swordsman of the mist at that point Kisame actually felt that this man was easily weirder than the man with abnormally large eyebrows. The fact that the person was convinced that they knew each other had no effect however. Reet, drawled the man before morphing his face into one of disappointed frustration. You don't know me, fine I'll humor you, I am the author of the greatest series of romance novels the elemental nations has ever known, 
I am known by all my loyal readers as the heir to the perverted master himself, I am Kazuma Urashi. You know Jiraiya of the Sanin? Kisame slowly asked. Yes, I am without a doubt in my mind, his chosen successor to the perverted arts. Okay then, I think I'll just get moving again and pretend I never had this disturbing conversation. This has to be some kind of detailed mirage that I am going to hate myself for talking to. With that Kisame turned and walked around the confusing figment of his imagination which had plainly walked up to him and mentally disturbed him. Oi, Kisame, where are you going? shouted out Arashi. To make a mess out of some group of ninjas day. Can I stay and watch? Why, you always make fights entertaining. Fine, but if you get involved in it you better. I get it. Quote, I better know how lucky I am, now unquote. This isn't the first time I've seen you fight someone you know. Sure it isn't, Kisame said as he found a place to wait out the Konoha team arrival, before he muttered something under his breath. Stupid desert and its detailed mirage lies. Namikaze Naruto leisurely walked away from his old friend with his arms still in his practiced thinking pose. He was curious about Kisame's seemingly genuine lack of recognition upon speaking with him. Usually when he and the Kiri Shinobi crossed paths one of the first things asked was whether or not Naruto had a new book on hand. That lack of a traditional question prompted Naruto to use the pen name that he used to write his novels. Even after identifying himself as Arashi Kazuma there had been no recognition in his friend's eyes. Worse, there hadn't even been the regular Kohai honorific his one-time teacher usually added to his name. The only sliver of their connection that he could gleam was when Kisame first locked eyes with him. Even then, all he could see was the faintest sort of having met perhaps once before in the swordsman's gaze. That was disturbing thought, almost as much as waking up in a desert. And just as bad as seeing Kisame without the ever lovely and dangerous Uchiha Atari. The former heir to the short-lived Namikaze clan failed to suppress a perverted giggle as he thought of the Sharingan-wielding woman. His oldest friend and teammate, first crush, one-time fiancé, and the best woman he had ever had the pleasure of sleeping with. And their last night together still remained burned into his memory. He loved the fact that neither of them ever let themselves get drunk. Being drunk always fogged up memories, according to Aero Senen. Oi, what is up with the giggling Arashi? Called Kisame from where he had turned his back on the blue-skinned swordsman. Having awesome crazy sex with your hot partner in a hotel shower is too much of a great memory for me not to Kisame Senpei. Naruto said as he looked over his shoulder. For whatever reason the blue man's skin seemed to pale upon hearing that and he held the short-lasting stare with the Namikaze for a mere second before then turning to look in another direction. Curiously he also brought his hand up to what Naruto assumed was his mouth. Huh, I didn't know Kisame could change his color so fast. Still cool how he loses instead of gains color when I mention banging a Terry to him. Makes it all the more unique when compared to Sasuke's response when I first told him his big sister was just as great in bed as she is with everything else she does. And definitely better than when their dad fainted after he walked in on us. Man that was a great way to end the celebration for me making Anbu captain. It probably was for the best that a Terry was not with Kisame at the moment. After all it had been over a year since their last encounter. And considering he didn't have a bloodline to make a wooden house like some people, there would be a place for them to get reacquainted with each other's bodies. Unless she had some secret fantasy to have sex in the open desert that she had yet to tell him, at least that is. Note to self. File that last though away for my next book. It has potential, wouldn't you agree Q? Naruto abruptly stopped walking as soon as the thought did. The Kyubi no Kitsune, the nine-tailed fox and most powerful of the living Biju. The demon that had been sealed within him on his mother's deathbed at age seven, and only rediscovered three years ago when he had first began searching for the memories he had lost. Memories that were lost as Orochimaru had forced him to forget much once the Sanin had finished experimenting upon him. Surprisingly the memory of being the Jinchuriki for the Nine Tails had been hidden away deep inside his mind after the trauma he sustained from the forced transformation into the demon form itself. The very same creature, whose mindless body was now slowly coming apart within him, that was slowly killing him despite being all but dead itself. Even now he could feel the traces of demonic chakra beginning to poison the cells in his body and his own chakra supplies. 
The seal which had held the fox for so many years constantly now caused a burning pain that spread over his entire body. And worse, what was left of the fox's power was at most only about five and a half tails of chakra left. An amount that was decreasing at a consistent rate that could not be slowed down by any means. He supposed that in many ways he was quite fortunate for a Jinchuriki. He was the last surviving one after all, and if not for his Akatsuki allies would have been just as dead as the other eight. His only wish was that there had been a better way to stop the extraction of the Kyuubi from his body. Unfortunately the only way had been to actually cut the chakra transfer after the extraction process had already begun. The result had been Naruto surviving, but the Kyuubi's mind being destroyed as well and leaving a vegetative body behind. Considering that a biju was a mass of sentient chakra for all intents and purposes the only thing keeping their bodies together was their consciousness. Meaning that without one it was inevitable that the remaining chakra within his body would either be released upon his death and bring a new weaker fox into existence, or slowly poison him. Regrettably it had been the later that had occurred. As he slowly walked up a fairly tall rock formation Naruto realized that for the first time since being captured he could actually think on his situation. Aiding his Akatsuki rescuers battle the army of ninja Uchiha Madara had under his command, and then the man himself at the same time was a test of his skill and determination to survive. Naruto knew that he barely survived that battle with the living legend two days prior. If he hadn't been able to combine two separate space-time ninjutsu to make that impromptu trap at the end, the Namikaze had no doubts as to who would have been the victor. Uchiha Madara was far above him in every way imaginable, excluding perversion that is. Even with the surprise arrival of Ateri on his side hadn't evened out the difference in skill. As he reached the top of the formation Naruto dropped back first onto the rocky surface. A relieved sigh escaped him as he allowed the bliss he felt from simply laying there to overcome his senses. The rock was at a nice temperature considering its location, meaning that it was hot but not enough to slowly boil his skin if he did not move for long periods of time. There was even a faint breeze that tickled his skin and pulled at his dirty blonde hair. That reminds me, the Namikaze thought ruefully, I need a shower right away. Not to mention a nice change of clothes to go. Stupid space-time ninjutsu mess, making my clothes even worse than they were just fighting Madara. Naruto raised his head and looked down at his now near ruined outfit. The red trench coat he often wore was missing, lost in the fight before he had been captured by Madara's forces. The black, Suna-influenced, flak jacket he wore beneath it was shredded to the point where it only covered a small fraction of his body and was now useless. The black shinobi pants he wore had somehow remained intact for the most part. The right pants leg was missing below the knee and the painted red foxes on the sides of both legs were covered in enough dirt and sand that they were nearly invisible. The bandages he had wrapped around both forearms had been removed after they both caught traces of the black flame that had nearly burned him alive. The black fingerless gloves he wore on each hand were still in place and in reasonably good condition. Both of his blue shinobi sandals were much the same as well. The thin, but lightweight metal, hatoki do he wore under the flak jacket was covered in hundreds of scratches and burns from his recent battles. There was even a dent, at the center of a large series of cracks, from where the Uchiha clan founder had managed to deliver a powerful kick that knocked him to the ground and nearly ended their fight then and there. The leather menpo face mask he wore was in the best shape of all. The only reason it was in such fine condition was that he had only put it on after waking up in the desert earlier yesterday. Slowly he reached down beneath his chest armor and pulled out a black ribbon. After he had a better grip on the black fabric Naruto pulled out what it was attached to his old Konoha Shinobi Hitai. The metal was rusted and covered in small nicks over its entire surface. Two prominent lines crossed over the leaf symbol in the center, one from when he had left his village for good, and the other from when Ateri had first found him after that. Not even fighting Madara had the same level of fear as seeing the look of anger on Ateri's face for the first time. With a noticeable reluctance to get up, the last living Namikaze stood up and pulled out a scroll. Pausing for a moment the blonde reached down and picked up a pebble. He then promptly threw the small stone at the resting swordsman who had his eyes focused on the bandaged sword. The pebble landed at his feet and caused him to look up at Naruto with a questioning look. Naruto then made turn around gesture before pointing first at his ruined appearance, then at the scroll, 
and finally made a show pretending to get dressed. Kisame made a disgusted sound before turning his head to avoid seeing the curious man change. Satisfied with his response, Naruto quickly placed the scroll down before flattening it out. After making sure there were no creases in the paper he then raised his left thumb to his mouth and bit down. The Namikaze then lowered his bleeding thumb to the scroll before swiping it across the seals. Immediately the scroll burst into smoke and he slowly stood up. Before the smoke had fully dissipated he had already removed his pants, the remains of his flak jacket, his face mask, and blue sandals. When the smoke was gone and revealed his new clothes Naruto was only wearing a somewhat old and worn black Konoha shinobi uniform with a faded red swirl on both sleeves. The Namikaze gazed at the crisp and clean clothes, perfectly folded before him. His father's old clothes, the ones he preferred to wear as much as possible instead of the Hokage robes. Naruto had always felt attached to chosen attire of his father, which consisted of a standard Konoha Nin uniform including the iconic two bands of both sleeves, and a jonin flak jacket. The white short-sleeved trench coat that was worn over his normal attire after being elected Hokage. The coat also had the flame-like designs on the edges that had always fascinated him, along with the kanji meaning, the fourth fire shadow, written down the back. For some reason or another, many of which he made himself, the Namikaze had never felt like he was ready to wear them. Naruto smiled down faintly as he thought of his late father and hero before looking up into the clear and open blue sky. His mind wandered to the questions that had never left his thoughts for long since he left his village six years earlier. I bet dad never saw me becoming a missing nin coming. Wonder what he'd have thought about that. Mom would probably have told me to make my own choices no matter where they led. Dad though, would you be disappointed in me father? I've had to kill Shinobi and Kunoichi from our village sent to hunt me. I almost killed Kakashi and Iki the last time we met. Naruto shook his vigorously to stop himself from feeling depressed and begin to doubt himself. One of the earliest things he had learned was that those who doubted themselves, tended to be the ones who never got to get off the ground after they landed. Looking back at the clothes, he felt the urge to put them on for the first time. Crouching down he picked up his father's Jonanflak jacket and slipped it on first. After zipping up the jacket he then picked up the white coat slowly. Unfolding it Naruto held it before him and looked the kanji written on the back. He lovingly moved his fingers over them as memories of the time he had spent with his father came to the forefront of his mind. The pain of his loss still felt fresh to the 22, almost 23, year old man. Namikaze Minato, the Yondaimi Hokage and Kanahagakur's yellow flash, was murdered the same day Naruto had become Anbu captain on his 15th birthday. Just hours after he had walked in on his newly promoted son, and soon-to-be daughter-in-law share their first real kiss. His father had laughed warmly before embracing his, fully grown fish cake, kissed a terry on the forehead, and then pulled them both into a final picture with him. Soon after Orochimaru had lured him into a trap where Naruto was captured and became one of the Sanin's many experiments. A year later during the escape of the damned snake a crazed, Naruto admitted he had grown somewhat insane over that year, Namikaze left the village soon after. But not before he broke into his father's memorial and took the clothes and scrolls from the family vault. A single tear fell down his cheek before landing on the stone below. Without even making an attempt to wipe the tear streak away, Naruto reverently put his arms through the sleeves and then tied the small orange rope on the front to secure the white coat. Picking up the four bands Naruto soon moved two of Minato's bands onto each of his sleeves. Lastly were the blue shinobi pants and pair of black sandals, each made of the same design as those worn by his father. After putting these on the namikaze placed the ends of the pant legs into the sandals before wrapping them under some spare bandages in the scroll. After straightening back up he realized that one thing was still missing. Sighing he picked up the headband from where he had left it. The namikaze then pulled his hair up slightly before slowly tying the headband onto his forehead. Letting his hair down he pulled out a kanai to take in his appearance. To his joy Naruto looked almost exactly like how his father did, years ago. The only difference he could see was that his father had jaw-length bangs on both sides of his face, while Naruto's own were uneven after having them cut by a stray shuriken. In addition he also had the fading whisker marks that had appeared when the QB was first sealed within him. A pity really, 
Women thought those marks were cute. Deciding to fix what he could, Naruto used the kanai he had been using to reflect his image to cut off what was left of his own jaw bangs. They would grow back soon and not to their proper length, and then he could be mistaken for a clone of his father. Putting back the kanai in the flak jacket he then dropped back down on his back, arms and legs spread out. He started to blow on some of his blonde bangs which fell down over his eyes. It was as he closed his eyes that Naruto felt the familiar feeling of boredom creeping over him. Kisame, the blonde called out lethargically. What, was the reply from the feared Kiri swordsman. The missing nin had chosen to wait for the team from Konoha by leaning against a large rock with his precious sword resting on his lap. His head was propped by a single hand as he sat bored as well. I'm bored over here, when are those ninja you mentioned going to be here? Sometime soon I hope, I'm getting bored here as well. Do you have a bingo book on you by any chance? Asked Naruto randomly. Why do want one? Kisame asked more to pass the time than out of curiosity. Aside from shark fin soup, the one thing Kisame hated more than anything was waiting for a fight to come his way. He much more preferred going out and finding one himself. I want to see who made S rank recently. Maybe I'm on there now. Who cares? Do you have one or not? Naruto said in response along with an underlying amount of a whine in his voice. Actually I do kid. Not the most recent thought. This one came out about two months ago. Kisame finally answered the original question. Suddenly a feral grin crossed his shark-like features as a thought crossed his mind. There happened to be a picture of Itachi in the bingo book he was about to toss over. Considering what the curious person had said of his stoic partner, Kisame wanted to see what kind of reaction seeing that picture would get. The S-ranked criminal calmly stood up to his full height before reaching into his Akatsuki cloak. His hand found the lightweight book easily enough and soon pulled it out. His predatory eyes located where the curious Arashi had gone to before cocking back the arm with the book. Once he had found the blonde with the mildly familiar blue eyes, Kisame launched the book without warning. Naruto not hearing a response began lifting his head up as he heard something cutting the air as it moved. Looking around he saw the incoming bingo book fast approaching. Blue eyes widening in surprise Naruto shouted a single word before being struck in the face. Kisame. As the sound of paper smacking flesh rolled over his ears Kisame barked out a guttural laugh as he heard the man begin cursing him under his breath. For whatever reason, there was something about the Arashi that interested the blue-skinned man. Some part of him hoped that the man was some unknown quantity with s rank skills that had gone unnoticed for whatever reason. If so then perhaps the interesting blonde could be a potential candidate for Akatsuki if one of the current members were to meet an untimely end. Oi! Arashi! What is it? You interested in joining the Akatsuki? Been there, done that, had a blast, met fine women, and learned a lot. Say what? Since when is Zabuza down to a lowly B rank status? The Namikaze asked at the same time. Last time I saw him he was the Mizukage, what happened there? Kisame continued to hear the man ramble about many of the ninja in the book in confused silence. Zabuza, the Mizukage, Arashi a one-time member of the Akatsuki. Shaking his head the swordsman began to accept that their Arashi was not a mirage. Kisame was not dehydrated enough to have his mind seeing something as messed up as that man was. Turning to face the stone he had been previously resting against Kisame lifted Samahata up and onto his right shoulder. Samahata sensed a nearing source of chakra that tasted odd to its own opinion. A familiar kind of odd chakra. Oh, so the green freak with massive eyebrows is one of those coming. Kisame asked his sentient sword. Made a guy, Naruto asked as he turned to another page in the bingo book. Some of what the young Namikaze was reading did not seem familiar at all. He didn't recognize half a dozen of the faces that he had seen already, and they were a rank or above. That was too many to be included in a two-month period without a war going on at the same time. Who, you said and I quote, Naruto halted as he tried to copy the voice Kisame had. The green freak with massive eyebrows is one of those coming, unquote. I only know one green freak with those kinds of eyebrows personally. Like I said, made a guy. So that's his name, nay, made a guy, wonder if he remembers me, Kisame said thoughtfully. Several minutes later, unknown desert in Kei's no Kuni. Huh, I recognize some of those guys. Who were they again? 
The one with the bulging veins around his, Neji I think. Naruto said before flipping back several pages. Ah, yeah here he is. Hayuga Neji, blah blah blah, rank Jonan, blah blah blah, master of Hayuga Keke Jenke. At his age, impressive, and the girl is named Ten Ten. Wait wasn't she on Ateri's team when she first found me after my exit from the village? And who the heck is that third guy? Okay, I know he had to have stolen those eyebrows of his. One guy with those massive things is probably a genetic abnormality, but two. Impossible, got to be stolen somehow. After just receiving the bingo book the team of Konoha Ninja arrived minutes later. Kisame had already shown off his skill with Suishin Jutsu when he used an underground spring to cover the immediate area in his best element. At the present moment the Konoha forces were each on a separate rock for each of them. At first glance Naruto gave the victory to Kisame due to his knowledge of the man who helped him learn how to really wield a sword. With a relaxed movement Naruto turned to a new page with no regard to the opening moves of what he believed would be a short battle. His eyes caught one particular line almost instantaneously. Uchiha clan massacre, was printed clear legible kanji. The former Namikaze heir's heart thumped in his chest as his blood ran cold. Two months old, that was what Kisame had told him. Perhaps he had been out of it for that amount of time, it was possible given the trauma the attempt to remove the QB caused him. Two months ago Naruto wasn't very update with the goings of the world either. That was when he was being constantly pursued by ninja under the commando Madara, as well as Konoha hunter ninja. During that time he had stayed as far from civilization as possible to plan and stayed in his safe houses. Two months could have seen quite a few changes. With that in mind Naruto read quickly, desperate to find anything to sat his worry. The last time he had seen a Terry was in their battle against Madara, and if she had been wounded she would have returned to Konoha maybe even arriving as the massacre first started. It did not look promising at all. From what the bingo book told, the entire clan had been wiped out save for one. Uchiha Sasuke, a Terry's little brother and his would-be future brother-in-law. Naruto felt his heart plummet as it went out to the boy. Sasuke couldn't have been more than twelve at present. Still the blonde kept reading and was determined to find out who was responsible. He soon found an answer. Uchiha Itachi, heir to the Uchiha clan and Anbu captain. The elder brother to Uchiha Sasuke. That was wrong though, it had to be. With his engagement to Ateri, who was the real heir, Naruto had been required to know the names of all of his fiancé's fellow clansmen as well as their faces. He had never once heard of, or even seen, this Itachi. But according to the bingo book he was responsible for nearly wiping out the Sharingan, and his own clan. Finally Naruto came across a picture, as well as the man's current status. What the hell, roared the now somewhat enraged Namikaze. He jumped up to his feet and glared down at Kisami's cloaked figure. The swordsman as well as all four Konoha Nin had turned their heads in his direction upon hearing his voice. Yeah, was the annoyed reply from the Kiri swordsman who returned his stare to the Konoha Ninja. Your partner is male, I know that, what the man, that's messed up. Your partner is supposed to be Uchiha Ateri, not Uchiha Itachi. So you imagined Itachi was some kind of, hot and sexy, woman when you slept with him nay. That, don't even joke about that. What the hell happened to me? What happened to the world? Nothing you're just insane Arashi. That can't be right. You just thought my partner was a woman and not a man. Who you clearly insinuated that you had sex with, and that I heard you two together. I have never once heard Itachi do anything of the sort, and therefore there is only one real truth here. You are some kind of crazy, maybe not insane, but crazy nonetheless. Team Guy continued to watch on as the Akatsuki member they were presently engaged in had some kind of argument with an unknown person. As they located the other person with aid from Neji they all had different thoughts upon laying eyes on him. It can't be, he looks exactly like Yandaimi Sama were the thoughts of the Jonin captain, made a guy. This man, his chakra looks familiar. But I can see something odd being leaked into it from within his body. Regardless, I should tread carefully. His chakra reserves are just as large as Naruto's are. Hayuga Neji, prodigy of one of Kanahagakar's most prestigious clans. It is strange, for whatever reason, I cannot help but feel that his flames of youth are the same as Naruto-kun's. 
silently thought the taijutsu specialist, Rock Lee. He looks hot, Ten Ten said out loud as she took in the man's appearance. At the questioning looks from her teammates and sensei the weapon specialist narrowed her eyes slightly and crossed her arms. What? Just because I take being a kunoichi very seriously I can't act like a normal girl every once in a while. Ten Ten, he could be an enemy. Warned Neji before he looked to Kisame and this Arashi with looks of equal caution. Enemy or ally, it still doesn't make him any less easy on the eyes Neji kun. Ten Ten quickly retorted before seeing the strange man look directly at her, his arguing with Kisame seemingly over. His eyes looked her up and down before smirking as they lingered on her chest. Team Guy's sole female member blushed brightly before pulling out a kanai. I take it back, good looking or not, he has to be a pervert and I hate them. Kisame, were you even planning on telling me that your partner was a dude? Or did you just decide to not tell me for some laughs? Because Kami is my witness, if you were I am going to hurt you badly. Senpei or not, no one messes with me shouted the now named arashi at the disinterested blue kiri swordsman hoshigaki kisame refused to turn his head in the direction of the irate blonde man instead has kept his predatory gaze locked on the group of konoha shinobi in front of him no at first it was because what you said was weirder than what i'm used to i was in some form of shock and disgust though that soon passed after that i decided to hand you the bingo book and let you find out the S rank missing nin from Karigakur showed his sharpened teeth. Besides, everything you told me is going to be loads of fun to tell Itachi about. And I fully intend to laugh at you later, after I finish these guys off, of course. No, 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 retorted the white coat wearing man as he moved to cross both of his arms across his chest. You are going up against me first, my mighty, tailed beast without a tail. And why would I want to do that, Arashi? You may interest me, but right now I want to rip off half that guy's face for not remembering who I am. Kisame said while pointing at the tensing form of Guy. The Konoha Jonan narrowed his eyes as he prepared for the inevitable attack that the Kiri swordsman was ready to make. The Jonan's eyes drifted off to rest on the second unknown person on the battlefield. The blonde man who very much resembled the late Yandaimi Hokage, Namikaze Minato. Guy was well aware of the jutsu Orochimaru had used to reanimate the bodies of the Shodai in Nadaim Hokage during the Chunin exams nearly three years prior. Konoha's sublime green beast of prey, was also aware of the fact that the traitorous snake Sanin was also an ex-member of the Akatsuki. If he had informed the organization of his reanimation technique, then it was quite possible that the man standing on the rock was the reanimated body of perhaps the most powerful shinobi to have ever lived. That was reason enough for the Jonin to be wary of the man. Especially as the Yandaimi look alike reached down to open up a pocket on his flak jacket. To Guy's shock and growing sense of fear, the man slowly pulled out a modified Kanai blade. The man's index finger slid into the ring of the three pronged Kanai and he allowed the weapon to swing slightly on the digit. Seeing that action alone nearly caused him to have a panic attack, especially as his eyes made out the markings on the handle in somewhat thicker length. The so called Arashi turned to look at Guy and gave him a warm smile as he saw the comprehension in the Jonin's eyes. You remember exactly what this is, don't you, Mate Guy? Well, I shouldn't be surprised. After all, you were around the last time this thing was used, I imagine. Arashi soon dropped his smile and became utterly serious. The resemblance to the late leader of Konoha now nearly complete, aside from his lack of jaw length, bangs on the side. The modified kanai was soon thrown in the air and caught in way that would let him easily throw the three-pronged weapon. Which he did and aimed just in front of Guy himself. Team, move, Guy cried out as he prepared to guard against the inevitable attack. Never in his years as a shinobi had he assumed that one day he would battle against the legendary Horishin no Jutsu, Flying Thunder God technique. The man disappeared from the rock he was standing on, and appeared near instantly in front of the group of Konoha Ninja. All present stared in at the red and black flash that followed the jutsu, and as the man stood up, flashing the members of Team Guy a vaguely familiar smile and lifting his right arm up for a thumbs up. Yo, let's leave the formal introductions for later, just call me Arashi for now. Arashi said before moving to bring his raised arm back to his side and then turning his head to lock at 1010 for a moment, namely chest level. 
Bring his left arm across his chest and cupping his chin with the right hand, Arashi took several moments to observe the girl before giving her an appraising look. I give them, hum, an 8 out of 10, also a 10 for the cute face, and a 7 for the body. You should try and wear clothing that reveals your womanly figure more often though, from what I can tell it would get a lot more attention sent in your direction. Aside from my complaints for that, you are an otherwise lovely Kunoichi indeed. 1010 10 sputtered as a bright red blush spread over her face upon hearing this strange, admittedly handsome as well, man comment on her womanly appearance. Oh, and an adorable face of embarrassment too. That's even better, Arashi added as he then took a step back to avoid being nailed by a hastily thrown punch. And a temper as well. I'm not sure I like that one so much though. Shut up. 1010 10 shouted as she held a handful of shuriken ready to be thrown at the cause of her great embarrassment. Her anger was returned with a disarming smile of amusement on the blonde's part. Um, all right, by your command, my young and lovely lady. The statement was also accompanied by a formal bow at the waist from Arashi. Seeing the action caused a wave of confusion in 1010 10 and Rock Lee, although the two Jonan remained weary. Both the older Jonan captain and his younger subordinate were most aware of exactly what they had just seen. Guy, from having seen the Yellow Flash perform it himself during the Third Great Shinobi War, and Neji, due to having heard of the Just You from his father as a child. However the man standing before the team was not the Yandaimi Hokage. There were several subtle differences that were now noticed as Arashi stood no more than ten feet away from them. The famous jaw bangs that lined the sides of the famed ninja's face were missing. Although there were parts of the blonde hair that looked as though they had been cut by a sharpened blade. His youthful appearance was more pronounced showing that he was several years younger than Guy, instead of nearly half a lifetime older. As a rough estimate the present Hyuga prodigy guessed him to be in his early to mid-twenties at most. Curiously his eyes seemed to convey a multitude of emotions that none of Team Kakashi's reinforcements would have expected from his outward attitude. They could plainly see the confusion, worry, growing fear, and weariness all trapped behind his penetrating cobalt blue gaze. As Guy continued to memorize the physical features of the man his eyes wandered up to the metal headband. Eyes widening Guy motioned for his now grown students to move back and behind him. His face morphing into one of disdain and disapproval the taijutsu master fell into his typical ready stance. I am curious to know, began Guy as he focused on the movements of Arashi's body, searching for any indication of a possible attack. Why a missing ninja from Kanahagakur is all the way here, in Kei's no Kuni? Upon hearing the words of their former sensei, the other three members of Team Guy also became aware of the slashed leaf symbol hidden beneath the dirtied blonde hair. Neji activated his clan's bloodline and readied his Jukan stance, Lee mirrored his mentor's own movements, while Ten Ten prepared to unseal a weapon's scroll. Arashi blinked upon seeing the somewhat hostile posturing of the ninja before him. It took them this long to notice who I am. Oh, if I'm right about where I actually am now, then it stands to reason that these guys would have no reason to know who I am. Oh boy, time to run damage control and especially with that Ten Ten girl here. Last time I saw her I barely avoided a kunai below the belt. With his silent soliloquy finished the former Konoha Anbu captain slowly raised both hands in a harmless manner. Would you believe me if I told you I was trying to find out where my fiancé was by asking the blue guy over there? Asked Arashi while hooking his left thumb in the direction of Kisame. The Akatsuki member bristled somewhat upon the blue guy part, though he soon relaxed. At least he didn't call me a fish man, grumbled one of the shinobi world's most wanted criminals. The Konoha Nin, and the freak with the eyebrows who failed to remember him, paid no heed to his mutterings however. Why would he know anything about your fiancé? Ten Ten asked, voicing the question held by her teammates at the same time. Arashi sighed before looking over his shoulder and sending Kisame a scathing glare. Because technically, he is my fiancé's partner and the jerk didn't tell me something that a guy should be completely aware of before he starts talking about stuff. Arashi shouted the last part at the now smirking Kiri swordsman. Well Arashi, if you really want to get technical, then technically you started talking about my partner and what you did in Anami no Kuni Hotel some time ago first. I said nothing on the matter at all. Oh shut up, and how do you know I wasn't talking to your sword? Samahata doesn't talk to strangers. For the most part, 
it's just me and him communicating. Really, I was joking about what I just said, you know. I wasn't, Kisame deadpanned. Eyes blinking Arashi began processing the new information before shaking his head. Turning back to the Konoha force he raised an eyebrow as they were all looking at him in an odd manner. Didn't you say his partner happened to be another man? Neji asked, his normally stoic face revealing a genuine sense of curiosity. A sentiment equally shared by both Lee and Guy, but not the female Kunoichi whose eyes widened as her mind produced a possible scenario. Yes, I did indeed Hyuga-san. To be more precise his partner is the, or I assume at least, infamous Uchiha Itachi. Arashi said simply as though it meant nothing. Great, mumbled Ten Ten who then sighed miserably before continuing. Why are a lot of the hot guys I meet usually either not interested in relationships or play for the other side? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up right there, shouted out Arashi as he suddenly appeared right in front of her. Ten Ten immediately stepped back surprised by the man's speed. How did you get here so fast? She demanded. I'm fast, now forget about that. I'll have you know that statement is a serious slander against my person. You should know that I am a hundred percent attracted to women. If I wasn't, would I enjoy doing this? Asked the blonde man before promptly squeezing one of the girl's s twice. Ignoring Tenten's response of nicking his left cheek with a Kanai Rashi's face took a rather thoughtful expression. Huh, I suspected that they were real and I was right. I just had to be certain about that, so no hard feelings right. The red-faced Ten Ten was barely restrained from attacking the man by the joint efforts of both Neji and Lee. Guy was about to berate the man for the inappropriate action he had just been witness to when Arashi brought a single hand up to silence him. Smacking the hand way the Jonin glared at the Rouge Ninja. That action was most unyouthful, even for a shinobi who has abandoned his village. True, I will not deny that statement. But it was the best, in more ways than one I assure you, to correct her on which side of the fence I stand on. Regardless however, shall I assume that you and your team are here to reinforce another team of your ninja forces? Do you expect me to reveal information about any mission my team is undertaking? I probably shouldn't know. Despite that, I will assume that your mission is similar to that if not exactly the same. Go on ahead. I have some business with Kisame to take care of. Arashi said before turning to face the Kiri swordsman he was discussing. After picking the kanai he had thrown from earlier Arashi concentrated on his chakra flow and began transferring his own chakra into the kanai, which he then flipped and grasped in a reversed grip. Gai Sensei, perhaps he is right. We cannot afford to be slowed down if we are to complete our mission. Lee informed his mentor as Arashi pulled out a second kanai and repeated his action with it as well. Now holding two of the kanai in the same manner the blonde spoke up again. That sword of his eats up chakra, so my chakra blades should be able to match it as long as I keep channeling a steady amount through my kanai. Get going while I keep him busy, ordered Arashi in a commanding tone without looking over his shoulder. I can take care of myself, after all, I used to be an Anbu captain. Anbu. If he really is an Anbu, and a captain at that, why am I not aware of this man? Any time an Anbu abandons the village all Jonin are made aware of it as soon as the Hokage is made aware. Who is he? Guy wondered silently before reluctantly nodding his agreement. Lee was right, Kakashi and his team needed reinforcements if they were going to be able to rescue the K's cage alive. Despite feeling uneasy at allowing a missing nin who could use the Yandaimi Hokage's trademark jutsu to be at the backs of his team, Guy gave the order to move one. Kisame made no moves to halt them however as he also prepared to battle the stranger Rashi. The blonde man raised both of the three prom kanai at arm's length and smirked at the Kiri missing nin. The blue-skinned man smirked in turn before hefting the massive bandage blade from its resting place on its shoulder. The battle began the instant Samahata was plunged deep into the rock Kisame was standing on. Naruto was admittedly curious as to reasoning behind Kisame driving his sword into a rock. His questioning was soon given an answer as his instincts kicked in and warned him to roll to the left. As his body began to move of its own accord he heard the sound of something coming up from beneath the water reached his ears. The blonde felt the small spray of water droplets striking the rock and his own uncovered skin en masse. As he completed his role Naruto's blue eyes caught the unmistakable wrappings of Samahata. 
A second rush from the water alerted him to another danger that he had no time to dodge. As a second blade came into his field of vision Naruto was surrounded by a cloud of smoke. The moment the second blade crashed through the smoke and into the ground where the blonde had once been, the Namikaze reappeared behind one of the two Mizu Bunshin. With an almost untraceable flick of the wrist his two kunai were launched at the back of the clone's necks. Both clones collapsed in a small torrent of water droplets. Kisame however did not wait for the water to fall to the ground before flying through hand seals, stopping at the hair seal. Naruto's eyes widened as he quickly twisted in the air before he landed, what he saw was a maliciously grinning Kisame Mizu Bunshin whose front palms were facing outwards at him. Sweden. Swiro no Jutsu, Water Release, Water Prison Jutsu. Called out the Kisame Bunshin as the water from its two brother clones Inka's Naruto in a bubble of water. The moment he was trapped however the Kisame Bunshin keeping him in place was killed by Kanai Slash from the real Naruto. Helping his cage Bunshin up to its two feet Naruto turned to face Kisame. Did you really expect that to work? Was the genuinely interested question from Naruto. The Kisame who had stabbed his blade into the stone simply walked around the bandaged weapon before shaking his head and dispelling, along with the sword. Great, so where is the real one? How should I know Captain? Asked his own clone before grabbing the original by the arm and throwing him away. As soon as it had saved its creator the clone was promptly eaten by a massive water shark. Rolling in the air Naruto was able to land in a crouch and stay above the water. The shark seemed to realize its mistake before finding him and moved to attack its original targeted Naruto. Eyes narrowing, he began making hand seals, beginning with the tiger seal and finishing with the ram hand seal. Sweden. Sukoden no Jutsu, Water Release, Water Shark Bullet Technique. He shouted out before the water around him rose up and formed an equally large water shark. The shark launched out to meet its fast approaching hostile counterpart. Both techniques collided and quickly cancelled each other out. Slowly standing back up Naruto ran a wet hand through his dirty blonde air several times before shaking his head quickly to lose the liquid. Come on Kisame, this is too weak to be your real strength. Get serious. Big words coming from a pup like you, came the reply from behind him. Naruto cut off the flow of chakra keeping him afloat and fell beneath the water as Samahata cleaved through the air where his midsection had once been. Turning around he disappeared in a flash of crimson and black as Kisame soon went beneath the surface as well. His sharpened teeth showing, the Kiri swordsman began to realize that his opponent was skilled indeed. Well, well, well. I did hear him mention being a part of Konoha's Anbu, maybe that wasn't just talk after all. This is going to be fun, ha ha. As the water cleared up from where Naruto's form had once been, Kisame felt his eyes widen one of the three-pronged kanai was floating in the water. Out of nowhere a second kanai with an explosive tag attached appeared alongside the Horatian kanai just in front of his face and exploded. From behind a well-sized rock Naruto felt the spray of water falling from the result of the underwater explosion. The blonde couldn't help but smirk as his newest jutsu seemed to work flawlessly. For the most part the technique was a modification of his father's famed Horatian no jutsu, minus a slight change in the ceiling array. Instead of teleporting himself to one of his kanai it would use an explosive tag kanai. The explosive tag kanai was teleported to the Horatian kanai just as it was about to detonate, allowing him to instantly send an explosive attack within inches of an opponent. Considering how it was clearly successful beneath the surface of the water Naruto realized that he still had to give it a name. His thoughts were cut short just as he felt the rock shaking beneath him. Jumping high into the air the blonde saw Kisame destroy the rock from below as he was revealed standing on the water once again. Landing a good 200 feet away from the swordsman. You know what, began Naruto as he came to a standing positioning again. I'm starting to think you're not the real Kisame. Your jutsu seem kind of weaker than what they should. Really, then how strong should my jutsu be then Arashi? Strong enough to make me sweat at least. Strong enough make me go all out at best. They aren't even near the at least mark. I think you can't have more than 40% of the real Hoshigaki Kisami's chakra levels. Naruto said calmly. To his surprise Kisame began a completely real bout of laughter. Raising an eyebrow the blonde began to rub at the back of his head with one hand. Was it something I said? No, no, nothing at all Arashi. 
Kisame said between attempts to control his laughter. Shaking his head the Kiri swordsman smirked right at his unusual opponent. But I don't see anything wrong with telling you that you nailed it. I'm not the real Kisame at all, though you have it all wrong on my chakra levels right now. I'm running on more along the lines of 30% of my real reserves. Oh well, Naruto said with a shrug before smiling at the swordsman. He did not have to have to go all out in this fight, meaning he was going to treat it as though it was one of his spars against the Hitaki Kakashi he knew. Fighting against someone he knew could kill him if he got sloppy, but could relax somewhat. Math was, and will always be, my worst subject. For some reason I keep having to use it though, it's not fair at all I swear. Ha ha, I like you Arashi, you're an honestly interesting person I'll give you that. Kinda cocky, but I have a feeling that's it is a well-deserved kind of arrogance. Kisame replied as he once again hefted Samahata on his shoulder. By the way, I have to know, what is your elemental affinity? I was born with a strong affinity for wind and water. How do you think I'm able to keep up with you without a Sharingan like Kakashi or an Uchiha? I'm impressed pup, there aren't many people who can go up against me when it comes to Sweden Jutsu. For the most part, the only ones who have actually did have a Sharingan. Kisame said while he cracked his neck side to side. It was then that Naruto noticed the rips and tears in his Akatsuki cloak. So then, that means he used Samahata to block most of the force behind my explosive tag. He may not be the Kisame Senpei I know, but he is clearly just as skilled even if that's not the real Hoshigaki Kisame of Karigakur. A compliment from one of the seven legendary swordsmen of the mist. Wow, now I feel all warm and fuzzy inside, thanks. Naruto said before bringing up a thumb to his lips and biting down for the second time that day. Moving his other hand up to his flak jacket he opened up one of the pockets. A scroll fell out of the pocket and he soon opened it. I think it's time I try and finish this, and I know just how I'm going to do it too. Though you'll have to forgive me for any mistakes you might see, I haven't had much practice with Kenjutsu, unlike yourself. As soon as the final words were out of his mouth his bloody thumb had slid across the entire seal. The scroll burst into a cloud of smoke after he threw it into the air. Stepping back Naruto held out his right arm and caught a large sword of comparable size to Samahata landed in his hand hilt first. The weapon consisted of a large red hilt and with an orange fox serving as the pommel. The blade itself was covered in lines that blended together and vaguely resembled something akin to puzzle from Kisami's point of view. What the heck is that? I've never seen a sword like that before, I have to say though, I like the way it looks pup. Very nice indeed, Kisame said approvingly as he took in the sword's appearance. The Akatsuki member then pushed his own personal weapon off his shoulder once again. The fight was beginning to get even more interesting to the swordsman who grinned in anticipation of the coming battle as his hands began moving to make a single lone hand seal, the snake. Sweden. Bakusui Shoha, water release, exploding water colliding wave. Kisame threw Samahata into the air before he tilted his head back. Manipulation his chakra within his body Kisame released an even larger amount of water. Combining with the water already surrounding them the jutsu created an even larger and more powerful wave. Finding his way to the top much the same as he had done with Team Guy, caught Samahata as it came back down to his hand. Naruto took a deep breath before closing his eyes to calm himself in the face of the approaching tidal wave. Opening them up again he quickly summoned up two cage bunch and sands the hand seal. Hefting his sword across his back Naruto began running across the water towards Kisame and his assault while the bunch and stayed back. The clones lifted up their own swords and began a series of unusual hand seals. They soon finished and lifted their weapons behind their backs before bringing them down in a swift slash. Futon. Rego Karikasu, wind release, chilling slash. The moment their swords came down a large wave of wind flew at the massive wave, avoiding the original Naruto by inches only. The wind slammed into the water and immediately began freezing the water from the impact point outwards. The wind chakra powered attack quickly overwhelmed the water chakra powering the attack and began to cancel out the power behind it. Kisami's face clearly showed his shock as his jutsu began to quickly slow in momentum. Taking advantage the real Naruto leapt towards the Kiri swordsman with the intention bisect Kisame at the waist. Seeing what his opponent had planned Kisame moved his own blade to block the attack. 
catching his strike on Samahata's bandaged form and then pushed back. Naruto managed to deliver a chakra-enhanced kick to Kisami's left shoulder thereby unbalancing the S-rank missing Nin from his position. Continuing through with his assault Naruto then swiftly swung his blade diagonally at Kisami's other shoulder. The Kiri swordsman managed to jump off before the attack could sever the arm entirely, although it did clip his shoulder. The wave itself ceased to move completely as the wind jutsu had finished its mission in halting the attack. Kisame landed on one side of the frozen wave and began to roll the shoulder blade Naruto had nailed. The arm was stiff and began locking up. The swordsman knew it would be a few seconds before the arm was back to par however. Unfortunately, they were seconds he didn't have as he felt a pair of hands wrap around his waist from behind and hold on to him. Suddenly a crimson and black flash met his eyes and Naruto stood in front of him, blade already moving to stab through him and the cage bunch and holding him in place. As the attack came, Kisame became aware of the seal that he had failed to see on Samahata's wrapping. Hum, so, this is it nay. This, this is what fighting the yellow flash must have been like. Kisame's eyes widened as his mind returned to his body. Feeling his sore muscles the large blue man began a series of movements to remove the stiffness. Cracking his neck slightly he looked off in the direction of where his fight against the man named Azarashi had occurred. A smirk crossed his face as he remembered the encounter. Kisame, we are finished now, came the familiar emotionless tone from his stoic partner, Uchiha Itachi. Hearing the caused a mischievous glint to shine behind the Kiri swordsman's eye. Kisame, hum, what is it Itachi? While I was providing my distraction, I was interrupted by an unknown variable whom I was not aware of. An Anbu captain from Kanahagakur. Shall I assume you had a similar situation? Kisame blinked upon hearing his partner's voice. In place of the emotionless monotone, was slight sense of surprise and an undertone of joy. Actually I was, by a missing nin from Kanahagakur by the name of Kazuma Arashi. You know, he said he was a former Anbu captain as well. Itachi I heard you reached that rank by 13, you remember that name from somewhere. No, no, that name doesn't sound familiar at all. I don't recall hearing about any Kazuma from either the Jonin or Chunin ranks. But Kisame. Itachi. The Anbu was an Uchiha, just like me. Well then, looks like things are about to get interesting in the future then, ne Itachi. Okay then, was the statement from one ex-Anbu captain by the name of Namikaze Naruto. The blonde son of the Yandaimi Hokage blinked as he took in the appearance of the man who had replaced Hoshigaki Kisame. Despite having come to the conclusion that he had in fact not been fighting the real Kiri swordsman, something which the man himself had confirmed, the Namikaze assumed it to have been a variation of the cage bunchen as the battle came to a close. However when he had plunged his own weapon through his opponent's torso there was no smoke or any sign of dispelling normally associated with clone jutsu. What did happen however was the body morphing into a man of shockingly similar physical proportions to Kisame. The man had the lightly tanned skin tone which many Suna shinobi developed if they were in a mainly administrative position. A long line and steady flood of blood cascaded down from his mouth and his face was adorned with numerous gashes and slight burns. His eyes were glazed and the pupils were missing entirely, leaving the pair of eyes stark white. The hair was even more dirty and unkempt than his own dusty blonde, a possible sign of either being a prisoner or constantly on the move. The fact that the man's face seemed rather thin and gaunt meant that Naruto leaned more towards him having been a very recent prisoner. The question was thus very simple and straightforward in nature, whose prisoner had the man been? Considering that while still controlled by Kisame the man, or was as Kisame, had asked whether or not Naruto was interested in joining the Akatsuki was a good indicator of one possible group. Then again, considering his inside knowledge of the organization, it made little sense. When he had been a member after leaving Kanahagakur, Naruto was fairly certain that they had never taken prisoners. With the goals of the Akatsuki leader Yahiko being the end of the Omegakur civil war, and as a direct result peace for the war-torn nation surrounding it, any who surrendered were given two options. The first and most often taken was to die a quick and clean death. The other less common option had been to join Yahiko's forces commanded by Akatsuki. That offer was only extended to Shinobi and Kunoichi with at least A rank skills however, and was rarely extended. Then again, he began thinking. This isn't exactly my world so to speak. Seriously, 
I just know I'm going to have problems remembering that all the time. Granted he had figured that out once he had seen the picture of Uchiha Itachi in the bingo book he was reading earlier. In addition to that, there was the now noticed observation of Kisami's appearance. The robes of Akatsuki were not the crimson cloaks adorned with black clouds. Instead the design was reversed with a black cloak and crimson cloaks. Considering how Naruto had spent the better part of an hour conversing with Kisame before battling him, he felt fairly stupid for not noticing the change in detail. Especially considering how he had been made an Anbu captain at age 15, and while he only held the rank for a day before Orochimaru of the Sanin captured him, Naruto was expected to be able to notice every minute detail of his environment. Oftentimes it had been that alone which kept him alive after becoming a new cannon. If his hands weren't currently occupied holding up his own weapon, as well as the literal dead weight still joined to it, Naruto would have formed a cage bunchen and kicked his own ass for his mistake. That was when the young Namikaze remembered that he did still have one cage bunchen still alive so to speak. He hadn't received the transferred pain of being run through with a blade when he finished the fight with Kisame, it stood to reason that the clone was still around. Raising his head Naruto called out to the shadow clone. Oi, why are you still around? Shouldn't you have dispelled by now since the fight is over? Naruto asked his solid copy. Well excuse me for still living. The hell captain, just because I happen to be a bunshin does not give you the right to casually use me as a sacrifice. I'm a cage bunshin that actually has feelings you know. The clone retorted hotly at its creator. After an additional moment the bunshin walked around the body still trapped along his own sword. Crossing its arms the Naruto clone gave the original a narrow-eyed glare. You have got to be kidding me. Another clone with its own sense of self. You're the hundredth one this year by my count for Kami's sake. Groaned the Namikaze air before turning his head to glare back at the bunshin with a matching glare. They held each other's stare for several heartbeats before the original broke off and released a frustrated sigh of defeat. His willful clone smirked before pumping a fist in the air as it reveled in the rare victory over its creator that some bunshin occasionally were lucky, or blessed enough on their side, to experience. Well if you're not dispelling yet, I order you to make another bunshin and kick his ass for me. Kami, I feel so stupid for not figuring out we weren't in our world sooner. Sure captain. I'll get on that right away. Actually, I think I'll just lay down and enjoy the clouds before doing that instead. It's not every day a clone scores a win over you after, and Kami be damned if I'm not going to enjoy myself before the feeling disappears. For the love of oh forget it. Fine, be the smug bastard I usually am. Glad you agree captain, the clone said cheerfully before turning to walk off and leave its creator alone. Stupid traitorous cage bunchin. Grumbled Naruto as he turned his attention back to his weapon. The blonde slowly tugged at the massive sword still lodged in his opponent's torso several times. After several test pulls to determine the best way to remove the large mass of Kiri forged steel, he soon came to an unpleasant discovery. The blade had skewered the man in such a way that every possible way to pull it out would result in him being showered in a torrent of blood. With a tired sigh the Namikaze wondered why he had chosen to use a weapon he had little practice in using against his Kisame-controlled opponent. If he had chosen to use either his Ninjutu or Tonto then he could have exploited nearly two dozen possible points for a clean kill. Both were weapons he had used successfully since he first became a Chunin, and were designed for him to use Chakra Flow quickly and easily. The larger weapon he had opted to use however likely ripped apart many of the dead man's internal organs and arteries meaning that the blade itself was keeping the blood trapped in the body. Suddenly he had a brilliant idea to get back at the bunshin. And a grin that had struck fear in many Kanahagakar ninja soon crossed his face. Naruto removed one hand from the red handle before gaining the clone's attention by flipping it off, then he roughly pulled out the weapon. In the instant before the blood gushed from the dead man, Naruto had switched places with his last real active bunshin. The clone gave a startled shout as it was coated in a layer of blood pouring from the opening in the dead prisoner's body. As it wiped away the blood from its eyes Naruto launched a kunai into its shoulder thereby dispelling it. And so ends disobedient cage bunshin 100, commented the namikaze before letting out a short, and in his mind at least, well-deserved maniacal bout of laughter. Naruto then began a leisurely walk forward and bent down to retrieve both the sword and the kunai he had thrown. 
Placing the three-pronged kunai back in the storage seal added into one of his flak jacket's pockets, Naruto then dipped the sword into the water and washed away the blood. Once satisfied that his weapon was properly cleaned he sealed it away as well. The former Namikaze clan heir was about to leave the impromptu battlefield before he realized something he had missed. Looking all around him in a haste he tried to find something he had stupidly thrown away in a cavalier manner. It was with a sense of annoyance directed at himself that he soon pulled out an additional kunai before summoning another clone. What did you need cap? was as far as the clone got before noticing his creator's grim expression. As the Bunshin raised his arms up in an attempt to protect itself a kunai found struck it between the eyes. A popping sound and smoke later and Naruto had taken out a second one of his own clones in a single hour. That felt most refreshing in my own humble opinion. Naruto said before shaking his head in momentary amusement. Who am I kidding, that felt great. With the growing annoyance controlled the young Namikaze began to gather his chakra. Forming one of his staple hand seals he soon closed his eyes and expanded his chakra throughout the water. He could still feel traces of Kisami's own chakra within the small lake of water surrounding him. With practiced movements he cleared his mind and began to will his own chakra to overpower the remnants Kisame had left behind. The dual elemental user slowly felt himself gaining more and more control over one of his primary elements. The action proved infinitely easier with the Kiri swordsman and water master miles and miles away and no longer exerting any form of control over the liquid. Once he obtained sufficient control of his element it was fairly simple to return the water back to the underground spring where Kisame had used his own nature manipulation to bring up to the surface. Opening his cobalt blue eyes Naruto exhaled his breath slowly as his chakra returned back to him. While he may have had an affinity for water, the Namikaze had a difficult time manipulating large amounts of it in the manner he had just done. He theorized that it was the same reason why it had been so unbearably difficult to climb trees and surfaces of water after he became the Kyubi Jinchuriki, the massive amount of chakra. Although it may have been because he had also been born with a larger than normal amount of chakra as well. The point was that up until he had become a chunin and began to practice controlling his dual affinities, he had terrible chakra control. Even years after starting his training to control water under an anbu known as Yamato it was still somewhat difficult for him to control the amount of chakra he released to manipulate the water around him. Nevertheless he felt happy enough that he could manipulate water as fast as he did, wind was twice as difficult to master and required him studying directly under Shimura Danzo from his 11th year right up to the year before making anbu captain. Smiling slightly at the thought of his perfectionist old war hawk of a wind instructor, Naruto then formed one of his most often used hand seals. Almost instantly a hundred cage bunshin appeared in a circle around him on the quickly drying desert ground. The original Naruto soon used an E-ranked jutsu to project his voice enough for them to all hear him at once. As long as he could remember the blonde had always hated having to repeat anything he said. Spread out over the whole area of our little skirmish and find my Hiroshin Kanai. I was a bit more reckless than usual this time around, and well, we need them and I'm too damn lazy to look for them myself. You guys do it for me, all right. Naruto informed the mass of clones surrounding him. He waited a full minute for any possible questions before waving the force off. All 100 disappeared in a swirl of leaves and left the original all alone. Narrowing his eyes he looked around for any bunshin who had developed a will of their own much like the one from earlier. Noticing the lack of any smart-mouthed comments, the blonde Namikaze nodded to himself in approval. Damn I really have to figure out exactly how some of them get like that. Not knowing which of my clones may or may not obey me is really troublesome, great, now I feel like Anara. His eyes looked up at the blue sky above him and blinked several times as he noticed there were no clouds above him. Shrugging his shoulders, and not caring about possible sunburn, Naruto looked around for several moments once again his eyes stopping at the same rock formation which he had rested on up until he had chosen to fight Kisame. Deciding it was as good a place as any for him to wait up until his clones found the missing kunai, Naruto shunshin towards it. Coming out of the shunshin on his feet the blonde man dropped to the ground and closed his eyes. The Namikaze opened his eyes and he found himself in a tranquil and lush forest of tall trees. It reminded him of the forests around Kanahagakur although grown to a much larger size. 
Getting up to his feet Naruto took in his surrounding before looking upwards and into the night time and clear sky. It had been months since the last time he had been in this forest. The forest was his own mental concept of the prison for the Kyubi no Kitsune sealed within him. Craning his neck around the blonde could see the mile-high mountains that lined the forest and had kept the Kyubi sealed since his seventh birthday. From the distance he could make out the massive seals carved into the very rock itself that prevented the fox from exerting too much influence of Naruto's actions. Occasionally the Namikaze allowed the seal to open up somewhat when he went up against Genjutsu users. During such encounters he found himself using the anger and bloodlust as an anchor which he could focus his thoughts around and break the jutsu. Despite certain short blanks in his earlier memories, thanks in no small part to Orochimaru Tem, Naruto was fully aware how utterly vulnerable he was against any genjutsu greater than a low B rank. At first he had been forced to physically harm himself in extremely painful ways to break free. Then in a, entirely accidental, dangerous situation he had found himself in the blonde unconsciously tapped into the dark emotions and thoughts that were the Kyubi no Kitsune's own. Instinctively he found a way to take these negatives and turn them into a means to refocus his mind and break any high-level genjutsu placed on him. Although he remembered how that use of the biju's chakra was ended once he was placed on a team with a sharingan, and therefore genjutsu, mistress. Eventually he had been able to teach himself how to resist all but the most powerful of such illusions, using the kaiubi only against powerful A rank and above genjutsu. By the time he had rediscovered the powerful Kitsune after a particularly vicious and difficult battle it had ranted for nearly a week about how ticked off at him it was. Then over a period of years Naruto managed to form a shaky partnership with his biju that for the most part was to the liking of both parties involved. After the Namikaze had become a new canon and made contact with the fox once again for the first time in years, their agreements were in dire need of repair and altercations. He and the fox had reached an understanding in that upon his death he would release the Kyubi back into the world, while the biju would willingly offer aid to him. The young Namikaze was not foolish enough to make the agreement without certain promises from the great fox however. In exchange for their agreement he had requested the greatest of tailed beasts to swear an oath to never threaten the home of any member of his family, Namikaze, Uzumaki, or any children he had with a Terry. The fox had been extremely agitated by the terms Naruto had offered it, although the promise of freedom proved too much for it to resist for long. Naruto was pleased to know as well that a kitsune never breaks a promise once made. While the Kyubi could trick people it could never directly outright lie to them as well. Using that bit of knowledge he had managed to outmaneuver the Kyubi and force it into a position where it had no choice but to agree to his demands before he had sealed the deal. The fox made no attempt to hide its contempt for him and the deal Naruto forced on it, although it did eventually swear to uphold their deal for as long as his line walked the elemental nations. Not that whatever deal they had settled on truly mattered anymore since he had been captured by Uchiha Madara and his army of shinobi. The Kyubi was nearly taken away from him completely, and all that was left was a rotting corpse sealed in his body. With the end of his fight against Kisame the Namikaze finally decided to go and see with his own eyes the body itself. The sooner he got it over with the sooner he could try and find anything that he could possibly salvage from the remaining tales worth of chakra the Kyubi had left behind. At the very least he could create another sealing array to reduce the pain he felt from the disappearing demonic chakra at its source. Naruto knew where the fox could usually be found within the prison his mindscape created for the beast. More often than not the Kyubi could be found lounging along the banks of a large lake in the center of the forest. His biju had preferred the cooler temperatures the lake provided and had created an underground burrow less than half a mile away. Considering the massive size of the nine-tailed beast however, the distance was more or less a minute's worth of walking between its burrow and the water. The blonde soon took to the treetops of the forest and began moving at an average pace for a ninja in the direction of the lake. As he approached his destination Naruto could feel the faint traces of decay in the forest itself. The smell of rot and death became more noticeable as the trees themselves began to look more and more diseased the farther into the forest he moved. Obviously whatever state the Kyubi was in, the fox clearly had a more significant effect on his mindscape than he had previously cared to assume. He grimly wondered how his mind would look once the empty body of the biju was completely gone. 
More than likely it would be nothing at all considering that it would likely only fully disappear once he himself was dead. Naruto viciously chased away such grim and unhealthy thoughts. The blonde had never once cared for his own mortality and he would be forever damned if he started literally inside his mind. Naruto was of the mindset that he would die when he died and nothing would change that. The blonde was also of the belief that the best way to live was as though each day was to be his last. Once he began thinking along that train of thought he realized that there was really little else different from how his life normally was. Nevertheless he would not change any part of how he lived his life no matter how much shorter it was fast becoming. He was after all Namikaze Naruto, son of the Yondaimi Hokage Namikaze Minato and his wife Namikaze Kashina, ex-Anbu captain, and one of the most infamous missing nin in the bingo book. The Elemental Nations, second super pervert, author of the Ika Ika killer novel series known as Kuraku no Kuni. Last of the Namikaze clan and fiancé to one of the most attractive and powerful women in the known world. A prankster and one of the most zealous, some had even labeled him a fanatic, believers in the will of fire. His life would always be filled with more battles and adventures than most ever saw in a lifetime. Naruto had never lived a simple life in his nearly 22 years among the living. He was always on the move, always setting a new goal or standard to reach, and never stopped giving his absolute best. Dying had no place on his list of things to worry about because there was another certainty alongside his near certain inevitable death. The fact that he would make sure that when he died it would not be quietly and most certainly end his tale with a bang, and possibly after one last wild night with good company. Feeling one of his well-known grins coming to his face again Naruto doubled his speed. The sooner he reached his target the sooner that he could go about regaining much of his lost strength. The Namikaze knew very well that he could be labeled as an arrogant ass for his opinion on his own skill, but he truly did not give a damn. Considering who his parents were, who his teachers were, what near legendary jutsu he knew and improved upon, as well as what he had survived against, and the perverted teacher he had beat several times, Naruto was certain he deserved to be a little full of himself on occasion. Before being captured by Madara's forces the blonde man guessed himself to be cage level easily. Although he knew full well that he wasn't anywhere near his old strength at the moment. With the injuries he had sustained in his fight against Madara himself, as well as the nearly successful attempt at removing the Kyubi from him, he doubted that he was any more powerful than Midhaijanan now. He would have to be even more cautious since he could no longer count on the also weakening healing powers gifted to him by containing his biju. Worse, considering that this was an entirely different world, there was a chance that Uchiha Madara himself was around and active as well. Perhaps even more powerful than the one from his world. Naruto would not allow himself to go down without a fight if he met the Uchiha once again. If he wanted to have a chance at ending his life however, he would need to find a way to regain most of the strength he had lost. The young Namikaze had an idea for how to go about that and that was why he had chosen to enter his mindscape now. If he could find a way to make his idea work then maybe Orochimaru's experimentations on him wouldn't be as great a nightmare to him as they still were. He felt his arm move unconsciously towards his heart and forced the limb to stop. Soon he reached the lake and then dropped to the forest floor. Slowly he continued on until coming to a stop at the edge of a new crater. The crater was easily two miles in diameter all around and half a mile at its deepest. The lake was no longer present and he could not even feel the cooler climate that normally pervaded over the immediate area of the lake. And located at the center of the crater was a large mass of pale orange fur. The large red eyes seemed glazed and lifeless and utterly alien compared to what he was accustomed to with the Kyubi. Its body laid on its side with its limbs spread out like a child's rag doll. There was however one discomforting and blatantly obvious difference between what had once been the most feared of the biju and what was presently wasting away at the bottom of a crater he suspected to have once been its burrow. Where once there had been nine large tails, there now remained five full-sized tails and one half-sized tail. The smallest seemed to be growing steadily smaller as well. The blonde slowly knelt down at the edge of the crater and brought his right hand to his lips. Biting down on the thumb he pulled it away from him to look at the blood seeping from the small wound. Normally the blood would have stopped within moments after the wound was healed. However the bleeding continued unaided for far longer than usual before the small bite had healed at last. 
With a sigh he bit the thumb once again before bringing his hand down to make a circle large enough to contain a person of his height. Biting his thumb after the bleeding began to again slow he then drew a second circle in the center, surrounded by five smaller ones. Each of the five smaller circles contained a different kanji. Kaden, Raiden, Doden, Sweden, and finally Futon. Stepping back up Naruto made his way out of the larger outside circle, careful not to alter any of the seals he had just placed down. He then slowly slid himself down the side of the crater to the bottom. Without wasting any amount of time the Namikaze pulled out a small piece of sealing paper before adding on a complex transfer seal. Coming to a halt before the mass of orange fur Naruto craned his neck enough for Cobalt to meet blood-red lifeless eyes. The eyes had tracked his movements sluggishly with only muscle memory compelling the body to do so. So then, this is all that's left of the Kyubi no Kitsune, most powerful of all tailed beasts. Naruto said silently while he continued to gaze upon the body of a once mighty creature. You know what you damned fox. Somehow I just know that you're laughing your furry ass off knowing what your corpse is doing to me. You were so worried about me dying you never thought about what would happen to me if you just went and left. Now your empty shell is falling apart and it's going to kill me by slowly and, you would have enjoyed this, painfully poisoning me. Slowly he moved his hand up and then towards the massive snout of the biju. Despite knowing full well that its mind was destroyed, Naruto could easily fathom the Kyubi finding a way from beyond the grave to still manage to bite off his arm if he touched it. The fox was always mentioned that anything that happened in his mindscape would have no affect on his outside body, ergo it had tried to eat him on several ventures into his mind. It was for that reason that he cautiously reached out to touch the beast. Much to his great relief, his arm was still attached to himself once it came into contact with the Kyubi's snout. Breathing a sigh of relief Naruto leapt onto its head, landing in front of the fox's forehead where he placed the sealing paper. Stepping away Naruto pulled out two kunai similar to his Hiroshin in that they also had seals covering the metal. He connected the two blades with five separate chakra strings and then moving them to make sure they were properly joined. With a slight intake of breath Naruto swiftly turned to throw one into the smaller central circle before plunging the other into the sealing paper he had placed on the Kyubi. The seal he had placed on the paper soon began to move and wrap themselves around the length of the kunai. Soon he felt the remaining chakra of the Kyubi become fully active once again. In quick succession he was assaulted by the full might of the poisonous chakra that was being released into his body. The Namikaze doubled over in pain as he felt his own chakra burning his insides as he struggled to breath in the face of the foul power. Painfully he formed the ram seal and fought through the pain to begin molding his chakra for one jutsu, while preparing himself to suffer through the pain for as long as it took for him to finish what he came to do. Before he began his jutsu Naruto grasped the kunai nearest him with one hand, while doing the same with the chakra strings. Fuinjutsu. Gogyu Seishitsu Henka Butsutekiryutsu, Sealing Techniques, The Five Elements Nature Transformation Physical Distribution. What he would attempt to do now was unheard of, something that no one had ever even thought of doing. Then again creating something new that by all means should have been impossible was in his blood, after all he was a namikaze. With any luck the seals he had laid out before now would drain away much of the remaining Kyubi chakra and hopefully either slow down the poisoning or at least dull the constant throbbing pain. If his luck held out, then he would have his way to regaining cage level strength once again. That or speed up the poisoning even more. Oi, Captain wake up. The deafening shout was accompanied by a none too gentle kick to the ribs, and then by an even louder cry of pain. What the hell? Shouted out Naruto while also nursing his injured side as he slowly pushed himself to his feet. Glaring at the dozens of cage bunshin surrounding him Naruto forced himself to calm down. Looking around he soon spotted a clone of himself who looked more pleased than his 99 clone brothers. Pushing through the mass of solid clones he soon stood before the cheery looking copy of himself. Holding his hand out the original waited patiently for the familiar metallic texture and weight of his custom made kanai. Um, Captain, the bunshin asked curiously while standing in front of its creator. Naruto developed a small number of tick marks while forcing himself to remain calm. Occasionally some of his bunshin were logically going to be less attentive than the others he usually created. It was for that reason alone that Naruto didn't decide to just destroy the entire lot of them. 
He'd only had enough time to finish one of the six seals he had planned to leave behind surrounding the Kyubi's body. You lot interrupted me in the middle of something very important. So, you better have found our Kanai. Naruto ground out between gritted teeth. The clone blinked several times before its eyes widened in understanding. Reaching into its flak jacket the Bunshin pulled out the three Hiroshin Kanai that Naruto had used against Kisame. He could see the explosive marks on one of the three, slightly burned metal and barely visible seal markings. Nodding his head Naruto quickly placed two of the three kanai back into the storage seal he had set up within one of his flak jacket's pockets. He soon noticed however a change in the position of their shadows. Looking up at the sun he saw that it had moved farther away from where it had been when he first closed his eyes to enter his mindscape. How long have I been asleep? One hour, thirty-five minutes. The clone standing in front of him answered after a moment of thought. Well I say we have a vote to decide what to do from here on out for the day. Called out another one of the cage bunchin. Forget it, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I want all of you to dispel immediately. Naruto said in the same tone he had used while in his Akatsuki after several more moments of thought. Yes captain. Left alone once again Naruto lifted up the single kanai he had kept in his hands. The sunlight reflected brightly against the slightly smudged steel. He wondered exactly where he would be appearing once he used his father's jutsu this time around. When he had taken the liberty to grope the female Kunoichi on Guy's team, Naruto had not done so just out of some perverted desire. He had also used the moment of contact to plant a jutsu shiki technique formula seal on one of the girl's kunai she held. He only hoped that wherever she was she wasn't in pieces. He had seen what happened to any teleportation if someone messed around with it. Thankfully it had been an enemy Jonin he'd tried to teleport away from one of his allies, once he had sent the Jonin away the body had never been found. Closing his eyes Naruto willed the Jutsu Shiki to bring him to it. When they had opened again he saw a vaguely familiar figure expanding to a large and grotesque size past several trees. Blonde hair and a slashed Iowa headband, and what looked like a clay bird behind it. Didera, and oh boy that's his suicide move. As the Iowa new cannon exploded Naruto had gripped the Hiroshin Kanai and threw it. Forming a short series of hand seals as the Kanai sailed through the air Naruto pictured the desert he had just been in before taking a breath. Jikuken Kekai, space-time barrier. The Kanai glowed a bright crimson and black before quickly turning into a flash. After the flash the explosion had disappeared. As Naruto blinked away the dots from his eyes he soon became aware of several pairs of eyes on him. One happened to belong to a shinobi with familiar gravity-defying silver spikes of hair, and single Sharingan. Looking at the face of one of his father's surviving genin, an older brother figure, brought a smile to Naruto's face. After reappearing next to the kanai he had just thrown, the namikaze slowly picked it up before sliding his index finger through the ring at the end of it. Turning to face the crown of widened eyes Naruto began to casually swing the three-pronged weapon while he walked up to the crowd of Konoha Shinobi and Kunoichi, as well as the elderly Suna woman and red-haired young man, and lastly a blonde boy wearing a frightening orange and black combination. The faces of Team Guy all stared at him in various types of apprehension. He stopped at Tenten for a moment continuing on. Naruto gave her another look taking in her sweaty and battle-weary appearance before giving her a flirtatious smile. As yet another blush appeared over her face the namikaze pointed at the tree he had appeared next to, more specifically the kanai possessing the same seals as his own custom ones. Taking the advantage of the weapon specialist's distraction Naruto quickly placed a kiss to her left cheek and causing her to eep, before looking even more embarrassed. After mouthing the words, for keeping my seal, to her he took several steps nearer to Kakashi before stopping a second time. Been a while since the last time we met, Nei Kakashi. Naruto greeted one of his oldest friends warmly before noticing the young appearance of the pink-haired Kunoichi. The other two Konoha Nin nod with Guy, are they your genin students? I have to say I never took you for the teaching sort. Kakashi's eyes continued to stare unashamed at the blonde man standing before him. Naruto could see that behind his face mask the silver-haired Jonin was opening and closing his mouth repeatedly. Namikaze sensei. Nope, I'm his son, and the name is really Namikaze Naruto. Kakashi's reaction was much the same as nearly any man in his shoes would have. He fainted, 
either from shock or exhaustion. The conscious and living members of Team Kakashi and Team Guy were flabbergasted. Just moments ago they had been in danger of being consumed in the suicidal last attack of an Akatsuki member, only to see the explosion vanish with a flash of crimson and black. Then a white short-sleeved coat-wearing shinobi entered the clearing and picked up a strange kanai before speaking with Team Guy's female member. After that the man had said a few words to an exhausted Sharingan wielder before proclaiming himself a namikaze, and becoming the reason for an experienced jonin fainting on the spot. The namikaze continued to stare for several more seconds at the fallen form of the silver-haired jonin. He caught sight of a decent-sized branch that had been blown away by the Iwa bomber, the Akatsuki s rank ninja Didera. Steeping forward, he picked up the branch and pivoted on the ball of his left foot to face the man who was lying on his back in a state of unconsciousness. Stopping nearly exactly two yards away from the seemingly unaware figure, enough to escape any reaction, the older of two blondes on the field slowly poked at one of the few non-Uchiha Sharingan wielders alive. Again, and again, you know what, the Namikaze said in an entranced fashion. This is actually somewhat addicting. I can't stop myself from poking him one more time and then I say, why not one more, and then I lose the will to stop. In fact, a puff of smoke was made on the other side of Kakashi, revealing a second white coat-wearing clone with an exact copy of the branch held by the original. I get to poke him too, the clone asked its creator. Addicting, came the fascinated and somewhat detached response. Anywhere I want, right? Sure, he's out of it, can't say stop till he wakes up right. Go for it as long as you're not one of those clones who developed his own sense of self that is. As if the world can survive any more of you captain, let alone a bunchen with its own life. Uzumaki Naruto was a young man who had acquired a number of titles in his short life. Many were well deserved for his actions, while others due to misconceptions he could not fault anyone for having. The young genin had been called a troublemaker, a prankster, a dead last, demon, monster, weakling, orange kid, and sometimes hero. The Uzumaki had seen many things ranging from traitorous fellow Konoha shinobi all the way to the monsters that were the Akatsuki. The blonde had met great ninja including all three members of the Sanin, Uchiha Itachi, and his friend Gara the Godime Case Cage. Even his Jonin sensei, Hitaki Kakashi also known as Sharingan no Kakashi, was one such shinobi, the same man who was now being poked with a kami damned branch of all things, by a man somewhere between his and his sensei's ages and a cage bunshin. Some distant part of the blonde's mind was curious how the bunshin was formed without any hand seals, the part that didn't want to find a stick and join in that is. The younger blonde ninja's thought process was soon stalled by his fellow teammate, Haruno Sakura. En na namikaze, as in, the family of the Yandaimi Hokage, asked the shocked and curious pink-haired medical Kunoichi. Like her blonde companion she was partially entranced by the sight of her knocked out Jonin sensei being poked by a stick. Unlike the ramen obsessed teen however, she was ready to strike the newcomer responsible for Kakashi's state of being. The only thing that stopped her from closing the distance and doing so, was the name the man had given them, Namikaze, Namikaze Naruto. What were the odds of two blue-eyed blondes being in the same place with the exact same name? Then there was the simple matter of the fact that the older blonde claimed to be the son of the Yandaimi Hokage. The now 16-year dead cage that is. The Kunoichi quickly estimated the man's age to be just below 25, meaning he would have been roughly 9 years old at the time of his father's death. Then taking into account that the fourth fire shadow had been just 27 himself the apprentice to the legendary sucker, Senju Tsunade, decided that the claim was not without merit. 18 was an acceptable age if not incredibly rare, for a shinobi to have a child. The pink-haired woman was still on guard as she waited for an answer. Despite his appearance being similar to the dead cage, it did not rule out the possibility of him being one of Orochimaru's agents. As an image of the sadistic snake Sanin came to the forefront of her mind, Sakura tensed her muscles. The traitorous missing nin was infamous for his experiments and he had a jutsu that could bring back the dead at the cost of a living sacrifice. She had read the reports of the failed Tsuna Oto invasion after she had first started out as the reigning Hokage's second apprentice. During his battle against the late Sandame, Orochimaru had resurrected and controlled the bodies of the Shodai and Nadaim Hokages while failing to resurrect the Yandaimi. 
The invasion occurred just under three years earlier and despite his insanity the Sanin was a genius. It was highly possible that he had managed to successfully resurrect the body of one of the most powerful Konoha shinobi to have lived. If that was the case then not only was he a threat, it was possible the so-called Namikaze had information on Orochimaru himself. Perhaps even the location of his current whereabouts, and by extent, Uchiha Sasuke. Huh, oh please excuse me, the Namikaze said sheepishly before dropping the branch he had been using and turning to face her. To answer your question, I will ask another. Does Senju Tsunade have a flat chest? If so, then I have to wonder if Jiraiya hasn't killed himself yet. Oi, don't make fun of Tsunade Bachan or Aero Senen. Naruto shouted at the older blonde man. This was followed by a low growl from his pink-haired teammate as well. The shout drew the attention of the self-proclaimed son of a cage, who blinked as he took a closer look at Naruto. Why are you looking at me like that? Trying to see if my eyes are working fine, or if I'm going crazy again. Not that I wouldn't mind a little right now though. The Namikaze answered while crossing his arms across his chest. After shaking his head the strange newcomer began a detailed appraisal of Naruto's appearance. This is going to cause such a headache, but I just have to ask. Are you by any chance named Naruto? Um, yeah, wait a minute, how do you know who I am anyway? Without giving an answer the Namikaze almost immediately appeared before the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi no Kitsune. Ignoring the sudden intake of breath from Naruto, the taller blonde raised his hand and quickly pinched both cheeks. Ow, what the hell? No way, the man breathed with a disbelieving expression on his face. That's not, I mean it makes, but you're, this is going to be a major headache. Without warning the Namikaze slumped over Naruto's body as unconscious as Kakashi. The clone stopped its actions long enough to see its creator faint on the shorter of the two blondes. Damn it all, he was right this is addicting. And then the clone dispelled at last with a sour expression adorning its face. As the smoke from the now late clone began to vanish the rest of the Konoha ninja exchanged odd looks with one another, except for Naruto who was desperately trying to shake off the curious blonde man from his person, oi. Somebody help me here, he's heavy. Ah, uh, he drools too. Shaking her head at the lack of tact from her teammate, Sakura moved to lay Lady Chio down before then going to help pull the suspicious blonde off of Naruto. The pink-haired young woman came to a sudden halt at the side of the hyperactive teen. Tilting her head she chuckled slightly, he really is drooling. Sakura-chan, what, it's funny seeing a grown man drool on somebody Naruto, even you would laugh if it wasn't happening to you. Yeah, but it is happening to me. Come on, please. Get him off of me, pretty please. Namikaze Naruto felt the slight change in temperature first as he slowly came back to his senses. Being unaware of his situation that moment he went out of his way to conceal his consciousness. The blonde kept his eyes closed and unmoving, his breathing and heart rate were both slowed down to a sedate pace. The analytical part of his mind, the one that he had honed during two and a half years in the Anbu Black Ops, told him that the increased heat he felt meant that he was likely inside of a building situated in a desert environment. Recalling that he had last been in a forest near Kei's no Kuni, the list of his potential locations was rather small. An unknown ninja would be taken to the nearest hidden village by the first patrol to come across them, meaning he had very little doubt that he could be anywhere other than Sunagakar. Careful to ensure he did not betray his newfound awareness Naruto slowly began piecing together his scattered thoughts. Eventually he began to remember the events that conspired to leave him in Suna itself, as well as how he first lost consciousness. A younger, by perhaps less than half a decade, blue-eyed and spiky blonde-haired Konoha Shinobi. A shorter him. Pushing that though away for the moment he continued to drudge up as many details as possible and make sure he his mind was not being stalled by any head injury. At the same time he took notice of a sheet of paper pressed to his forehead and the restraints that bound his wrists together atop his chest, and his feet together beneath his knees. The Namikaze also felt the discomfort of his face and chest being pressed into cold, and slightly sandy, floor. The air felt stale and dry as he took in air. His immediate summary was that he had been captured and had his limbs bound in preparation for an interrogation process. The paper he felt against his forehead was almost certainly a sealing paper set to prevent him from molding chakra for an escape. The cold and worn steel of his headband was also missing, 
likely taken upon discovering his status as a Konoha missing nin. In addition to the slashed hiade being missing, the ex Anbu noticed his father's white coat and flak jacket missing as well. The mind of a trained Anbu operative revealed that he was in an interrogation cell at the moment. In response to that, the mind of a Hokage's son was viciously berating himself for fainting and being captured. He heard the sound of a neck cracking slightly followed by a single footstep closer to him. A familiar and tired voice then began speaking, you can quit pretending to still be out like a light you know. Oh, it's just you my dear Kakashi. Damn and here I was hoping that I had been kidnapped by a group of women who intended to sell me to an attractive but lonely high-born lady, only to have their wicked way with me before deciding to keep my as their own personal pleasure slave. What? Even without turning to see the one-eyed Jonan, Naruto knew for a fact that the man had blinked at least twice before answering. Kusa no Kuni is a wild place to be if you don't remember to set up alarms before sleeping outside the capital. Man, fun as that whole week was I'd really prefer to avoid a repeat. Again, what, short answer then, I was pulling a Jiraiya in the capital city before I was forced out. The sound of forced down laughter echoed before the copy nin spoke again, you were quote, pulling a Jiraiya, and you were captured. In my defense, I allowed myself to be captured. Allowed yourself in the sense that you failed to set up basic warning alarms before you decided to fall asleep. Kusa wasn't after me, a second voice spoke up in place of Kakashi, this one younger and more controlled, which leads us to a question. Why is it that three Konoha Jonin, two of whom are veterans of the Third Great Shinobi War, have no knowledge of you at all? Neither your name nor face is any bingo book published by Kanahagaka or even Suna for that matter. You claim to be a Namikaze, yet we know the Yandaimi Hokage had no legitimate heir at the time of his death sixth. He died. When the hell did Namikaze Minato die, and more importantly how? You claim to be the son of a fallen leader of Konoha and yet you say you do not know how your own father died. I find that most, unlikely to be true. Deciding to at least remove one discomfort, Naruto straightened himself out onto the floor. Rolling off of his front and to his back the blonde lifted up both legs to his chest before throwing them outwards and landing on his own two feet. Turning carefully to face his interrogators the Namikaze at last opened his eyes before leaning back against the wall nearest to him. Unlikely yes, but also very much true. The Namikaze retorted before he began stretching what parts of his body he could. His cobalt eyes observed that in addition to Kakashi being present, both the Hyuga and Maida guy stood on either side of him. He also noticed that Kakashi seemed to still be slightly exhausted from using up nearly all of his chakra reserves. Locking eyes with silver spiky-haired John and Naruto shook his head in disapproval, Kakashi you mind explaining to me how you, a former Anbu captain, decided that instead of resting off chakra exhaustion you're here performing an interrogation. What would dad say about that I wonder? Single eye narrowing at the mention of his deceased sensei Kakashi again spoke up, how about we get back to discussing that shall we? Namikaze sensei did not have a son at the time of your likely birth. The war hadn't even ended by that time, so I very much doubt you to be his son. Naruto returned the glare with an equal intensity as he carefully chose his words, and yet he doesn't know who his father is. I'd have expected his sensei to have told him about his heritage by now. Hayuga Neji then responded by moving a step closer to the incapacitated blonde in a placating manner. With his Byakugan inactive at the moment Neji failed to notice his fellow John and share a shocked look. Deciding to move away from the direction the interrogation was heading Neji made a diplomatic move, for now I suggest that we move on to our other questions. I believe you will not be elaborating on any more of the statements you have just recently made. Lowering his head in the manner he had seen his father use when speaking to foreign dignitaries the Namikaze responded in turn, with respect Hyuga-san, you are entirely correct. Nodding in understanding Neji calmly continued as he began to take over the interrogation, very well then. This talk of heritage is of little importance and is not the most important topic we need speak of. Such as, perhaps you will be more inclined to tell us how you managed to come into possession of attire similar to the Yandaimi Hokage. Easy answer. I stole them from his memorial. The Yandaimi has no memorial. The closest would be his name etched into the memorial stone. Quirking an eyebrow Naruto looked over at Guy who spoke for the first time. Tilting his head to the left several hair lengths he turned his attention back to his primary interrogator, 
either there is a memorial and you don't know it, or none of you have ever bothered to notice it. Moving on now, Neji started before looking over at Guy who nodded once. Exchanging short bows of the head with the Namikaze, the Hyuga prodigy stepped back as his squad leader came up. When you first came up across my team you were conversing with an Akatsuki member. While you chose to fight him in place of my team, which I thank you for, it does not tell why you were with the man. From what both I and my former student could determine you were in some way familiar with him. Will you explain this at all? First off don't thank me guy. You would have dealt with him on your own without my assistance. That wasn't even the real Hoshigaki Kisame, it was a prisoner whose body was somehow being controlled by him. He even admitted it to me, along with how he only had roughly 30% of his real strength. Guy nodded as his earlier assumption on the nature of the Akatsuki interruption of his team proved correct. Placing his hands on the sides of his hip the bowl cut Jonan continued, very well then. You also mentioned that you knew of his partner. No, I said he technically was my fiancé's partner. I never once said I knew his partner. Quote comma quote, quote comma quote. Neji decided to break the awkwardness himself, his male partner you mean. Arg. I can't believe the bastard made me find that out from a book. Kakashi closed his lone eye for a moment before sighing. Looking back to their captive he decided to add in his own Ryu, my team and our Suna ally came across another member of Akatsuki ourselves. Uchiha Itachi, another missing nin from Konoha. Much like Guy's team, we were aided by our own mysterious arrival. A female Anbu from Konoha in our case, however, our Hokage did not send Anbu reinforcements. Let me guess your next question for you Kakashi. You want to know if I have any connection to this unknown Anbu agent? Correct. Actually, Kakashi began before looking curiously at the so-called Namikaze. Before practically ordering my team and me to continue on, she told us that we might come across a strange blonde shinobi. Naruto raised his head sharply as he heard what the silver-haired Jonin was saying. His eyes were wide and his mouth was slightly agape. His eyes were full of a mix of disbelief, hope, and even confusion. The Namikaze air soon glared fiercely in response to the older man's words. He felt his heart beat faster in his chest as he waited to hear what else the elite Jonin had to say. She said, and I quote, My partner is waiting for the super pervert's next book. Does that mean anything to you? The blonde-haired Namikaze's lips began moving a moment after the words had left Kakashi's mouth. His facial features clearly revealing his shock as he slowly and silently repeated the words back to himself. Moments later an eerily familiar grin slowly stretched across his face. Naruto began to chuckle, they're here, Kami I can't believe it. His chuckle soon turned into full-blown uncontrollable laughter. The three John and sweat dropped as their captive fell to the ground, his laughter echoing through the room. Kakashi and Guy exchanged looks of surprise, while Neji looked on in annoyance as the man continued to laugh. Regaining control of his actions, Naruto slowly found his way back to his feet. Traces of his near-mad laughter showing themselves as the Namikaze's body continued to silently shake. Taking several deep breaths to calm himself down before lifting his head back up to lock gazes with the three Konoha ninja. His smile still plastered to his face Naruto opened his mouth once again, that is the best thing I've heard in a good while. Why exactly is that? asked Neji while narrowing his eyes at the blonde. Because Hyuga-san, it means that I wasn't the only one who wound up here. A Terry and my favorite blue guy made it as well. A campfire burned at the center of a makeshift camp. A boiling pot was held inches above the flames as the stew inside it was cooked. A pair of tea cups was to the left of the fire, and large figures sat to the right. The figure appeared extremely tall even as he sat with his knees folded beneath him. The faint light coming from the fire flickered across his entire body. He wore a gray flak jacket with somewhat elongated shoulder padding. Beneath the jacket was a dark blue sleeveless shirt, a pair of matching shinobi pants, and matching blue waist guard, striped arm and leg warmers. Wrapped around his left wrist was a silvery metal gauntlet which had a black fingerless glove attached to it covering his hand. Wrapped around his head was a modified high eighth that expanded around his head to cover his ears. The forehead protector had the symbol of Karigakur etched into the steel, identifying the village which the shinobi hailed from. A large and bandaged sword was carefully placed against the side of tree opposite to the ninja. 
Just in front of him was a medical field kit his partner had wisely chosen to bring with her. The man's dark blue skin was a contrast to the white medical gauze he was currently wrapping around his right forearm. A pair of predatory eyes narrowed in annoyance as he recalled just where he was. Exhaling a deep breath the blue-skinned man's gill-like marking seemed to move of their own accord. Turning his gaze upwards he caught sight of a smaller figure atop the trees surround the camp. Damn it all Atari, your lover boy really knows how to make an S-rank mess. We don't know where the hell he is, and now we're apparently in another dimension or whatever. I swear to whatever created life that, his short rant was stopped as a kunai was thrown at his high eight. The ring of the weapon struck the center of the steel forcing his head to snap backwards, while the kunai ricocheted off of its target and landed blade down in front of the teacups. Dropping to the ground, his smaller companion slowly walked into the light caused by the campfire. The feminine figure's steps contained a fluidity that told of years of training and experience with every movement. She wore the common hatoki do armor worn by shinobi chosen by their cage to join the feared anbu forces of their villages. In addition she also sported the spiked ninja sandals common to the elite group of shinobi and kunoichi, as well black pants. As she bent down to pick up the kunai she had thrown, her bare forearms revealed that she did not carry any arm guards or gloves. After placing the kunai back into one of the pouches on her back waist, she also picked up both teacups. Turning to face her blue-skinned partner, who was moving his neck in circular motions to release the now stiff muscles, her white cloak billowed in the air as she walked towards him. The taller of the pair looked at his partner's weasel porcelain mask as she began to speak, the first thing you will do when you meet him again Kisame, is pull Samahead out and attempt to remove both of his legs. Failing that you will then beg to know when the next copy of the perverted filth will be released. And then, when you are informed of the date, you will moan and sulk away to find a river to swim in and release the stress you will no doubt feel. I don't beg, roared Kisame in a mock attempt to defend himself from his partner's light insult. As a member of one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, and still active hunter Nin, the blue-skinned man had a great deal of pride in himself. Even as a light-hearted joke, the jive at his dignity demanded an equally light-hearted, but no less meaningful, response. Would you rather I said grovel, or perhaps, get on your knees and bow your head before respectfully asking the master, would have been more to your liking. Beg is good, still, Uchiha Atari was an opponent he could never win against in anything save swordsmanship. Handing her partner one of the two cups of tea, Atari slowly sat next to him. Removing the Anbu animal mask she had chosen to wear the Uchiha woman brought her own tea up. The tallest of the pair did the same and they brought their respective cups together in a quiet toast. After finishing her cup of tea first Atari started to speak once again, it's been a little over four years now, hasn't it? Without even taking a sip of his own tea Kisame turned to answer his partner, oh. I guess it has then, time really does move fast. A pair of onyx-colored eyes looked up into the night sky on the border between Kei's no Kuni and Mizu no Kuni. A part of he wondered whether or not either her younger brother or even Naruto himself were doing the same. While she had not managed to learn much from her foray into a small village several miles away Atari found enough differences to know that the world she was in now was not her own. So many things could be different from what she knew, such as how an Uchiha had seemingly become a missing nin, and not just any Uchiha. This world's male version of herself, a traitor to the village that claimed her absolute and unwavering loyalty, Uchiha Itachi. Closing her eyes she took a breath before deciding to say more, four years ago, our villages formed an alliance. To show that they could work together both Kiri and Konoha selected several of their best ninja. These ninja were partnered with a ninja from the other village, and we were the only one that was truly effective. Nodding his head Kisame had a solemn expression as he continued where she had left off, and our first mission was to hunt down Namikaze Naruto. Your fiancé who left your village two years earlier, and also the same guy who I met a year after he left and helped teach proper Kenjutsu, he soon started chuckling. Kami, none of you Konoha ninja should dare claim mastery over the sword. Atari snorted as her partner finished, and not one Kiri Shinobi has any good taste in literature. Not even Mei Chan and she is the only one from your village I admire. Oi, you don't admire me, no, I respect you as friend, Kisame. My admiration is something few can claim to have, after all not even Naruto has it. 
Kisame was about to finally drink the tea he had placed aside before pausing for a moment. Achu. The random sneeze caused him to throw the cup of tea in the air. The content of the cup landed all over the hunter Nin and Anbu pair. Looking at his partner Kisame noted with a tinge of fear that her features had taken an unervingly blank look. Atari. Speak, began the Uchiha woman in an unemotional tone, and spilling hot tea will be the least of your mistakes this night. Elsewhere walking through a dark forest a similar scene played out. Achu, Kisame, asked Uchiha Itachi as his Akatsuki partner began a steady pattern of sneezing. The blue-skinned swordsman was unable to stop himself until nearly a minute after he first started. Are you beginning to take ill? Nope Itachi, must be someone thinking about me, answered the Kiri missing Nin. Raising a single eyebrow the slightest of centimeters the Uchiha stared blandly at the taller man. Turning back in the direction they were walking and he said, or perhaps you are getting a cold. I do not believe in that childish concept. Come, we need to check in with our nearest informant. Nodding his head Kisame soon followed behind his partner. The blue-skinned shinobi soon asked the Sharingan wielding master a question, Itachi, mind telling me something? Without breaking step the Uchiha answered, what do you want to know Kisame? Are you going to tell me how you fared against this mystery Uchiha woman? The Uchiha's partner asked curiously. It depends on whether or not you do something for me. Anything specific. Were you to finally cease mentioning that conversation you had with Kazuma Urashi, I might consider informing you of the confrontation. Maybe later then, I still get a laugh every time I think of it. Back up a moment, Kakashi said as he looked disbelievingly at the blonde man. You mean to say that you are from another world? Another world or dimension actually? I haven't got a clue which it is honestly, though you get the point. The Jonin continued as if he hadn't been interrupted, where your father, the Yondaimi Hokage sealed the Kayubi into you at the age of seven. In addition to that you were betrothed to the female heir of the Uchiha clan, a clan who supported the fourth's position no less, whom had a younger brother by the name of Uchiha Sasuke. Guy began his own summarization of what the Namikaze had told them. Not only that but you were both on the same genin cell and your Jonin sensei was Kakashi himself, whom you also saw as an older brother. You also were taught mastery of both your wind and water affinities by Shimura Danzo and an Anbu operative codenamed Yamato respectively. Neji finished up what the two senior Jonin started, you mastered both affinities months before your 15th birthday as well. Upon reaching that age, you were promoted to Anbu captain by the Hokage. That same day the Yandaimi Hokage was assassinated, according to your own assumptions, Orochimaru of the Sanin. Soon after you were captured by him and became one of his experiments, escaping when he did so as well. You became a Nukenon and became one of the most hunted shinobi in your world. Naruto nodded as the Hyuga soon stopped. He hadn't told them everything yet, he kept the details of Orochimaru Tem's experiments to himself, as well as what he knew about Uchiha Madara and his present condition regarding the Kyubi's remaining chakra in his body. Those were things he would reveal only in the presence of the goddaim Hokage herself. Being told that it was Senju Tsunade of all people who filled the spot of Hokage after the death of the Sandame had thrown him for a spin. From his experience with the Slug Princess, he would have expected Tsunade to have destroyed the Hokage Tower and replace it with a casino after becoming leader of Kanahagakur. In his own world it had been Jiraiya who was made the succeeding Hokage after his father's death. It was his becoming the new Hokage that forced the Toad Summoner to abandon his writing of the famed Ika Ika series, and pass it on to Naruto's own hands hours before his capture by Orochimaru. Guy turned to his eternal rival and motioned at the door. Kakashi caught the message easily and then began speaking to the Namikaze once more, do we have your word that you won't harm any of our teammates, or Suna allies? Naruto looked at the spiky silver-haired Jonin strangely before responding, I'm a ninja, we're not supposed to be expected to be entirely honest most of the time. However, given who I am exactly, I give you my word as Namikaze Naruto heir to the Namikaze clan. My father never broke a promise, and I haven't started yet. Really, what about when you abandoned the village and became an S-rank missing nin? Kakashi asked in amusement as his eyes curved into a smile. I told you already, I wasn't entirely sane at the time. I was somewhere between insane and homicidal as that gone on. The Namikaze retorted hotly. Of course, of course. Now I believe it's time to go now, right guy? 
Of course Kakashi, my flames of youth burn far too brightly for me to allow myself to forget when we are expected to return to Kanahagakur. Guy said before shouting loudly as Genjutsu appeared that showed a fire behind his eyes. Grabbing Neji the Taijutsu master was the first to leave the room, his student in tow. Kakashi soon followed after giving the Namikaze a final eye smile and then walked out the door. Wait a minute, cried out the blonde-haired shinobi as he realized that they had left him alone. Hey, get back here, you guys have to untie me. Several hours later the blonde Namikaze walked alongside the two older Jonin across the desert. It had taken some work but the rest of the Konoha ninja had accepted him joining them on their return trip easily enough. All except for the other blonde in the group, that is. First it had started with the argument about the Namikaze apparently drooling all over the Uzumaki, and then it morphed into an endless assault of question ranging from his name to his rank and instructors. Names were also an easily solved issue with the Namikaze choosing to go by part of the alias he had introduced himself to Team Guy with, Namikaze Arashi. I can't believe you asses left me tied up there for three hours. Naruto laughed as the older blonde argued with Kakashi and Guy several dozen feet behind him and the others. Sakura sighed as she realized that she was going to have two loud and crazy blonde guys to deal with for the next few days. The two Chunin members of Team Guy were both listening in as Neji recounted to them what the Namikaze had revealed to him and the other two Jonin during their interrogation. Kakashi sighed tiredly as Guy helped him walk. Looking at the fuming blonde he was surprised by the similarities between Arashi and the attitude of Uzumaki Kashina. He chuckled quietly as recalled a time when the Uzumaki woman had barged into the Hokage's office while Kakashi was being debriefed after a mission. The red-haired woman had said something incredibly similar to his sensei before pushing the jonin out of the room as she began exacting revenge on his teacher. Although Minato had never complained once after Kashina had left the tower, even having a glazed look in his eyes while going about the rest of the day. Kakashi was very glad he did not hear anything that went on behind the locked doors. Well Arashi-san, if you want we could tie you up for four hours instead next time. Asked the copy nin. Go to hell Kakashi, go to hell and burn. While he said that, Arashi was staring at his old rusted and dual slashed Konoha hi eight. He'd all but physically harmed Kakashi when he saw it thrown away in a pile like common trash. Running his finger along the edges Arashi remembered how he had felt when he regained his sanity, and realized what he had done. Leaving the village and fighting teams of his friends sent to bring him back had cut his soul deeply. Now he was just going to enter it despite his status as a rouge ninja because technically he hadn't done anything except wear a slashed high eight. Actually, None of the Konoha ninja could actually prove he was even a ninja himself when he thought about it. He wondered if even going back would be worth it, considering what he himself knew he had done in his world. Someone seems to be in a bad mood. Tenton commented over her shoulder as she glanced at Arashi. The blonde had taken to wearing a basic Suna Shinobi flak jacket with the shoulder guards above a sleeveless red muscle shirt and black pants. His white short-sleeved trench coat and Konoha flak jacket having been sealed away into one of the numerous seals tattooed along his right arm. Strapped diagonally along his back was a red-sheathed and black-hilted ninjutu, while a tonto blade was strapped along the side of his left foot. Oddly he had a strange spiral tattoo on his left shoulder. The girl flushed as she saw him wink at her when he noticed her looking over the Rue shinobi. The weapon's mistress glared quickly before snapping her head to face forward. Keep talking Hataki and I swear to Kami herself, I will burn all the Ika Ika in Konoha. And then replace it with my own books. If nothing else, this trip is going to give me plenty of time to remember everything I put into volumes 1 all the way to 9 of Kuraku no Kuni. You wouldn't dare, the famed ninja who had copied over a thousand different jutsu whispered fearfully. Locking gazes with his one-time brother figure before a thought came to the top of his mind. Smirking evilly Arashi began mouthing words at Kakashi, I have my father's technique. All I need is a record of all the bookstores that sell them, and the rest is up to your imagination, Scarecrow Kun. At the confused look from the copy nin, Arashi gave the man a straight-faced look. Slowly moving his left arm over one of the seals on his right arm, the Namikaze pulled out his leather menpo face mask. Seeing the surprised look from the older man Arashi calmly pulled the mask down over his face, covering his lower facial features. 
The Namikaze had enjoyed ticking his Jonin brother figure when he first bought the mask, and the joy of seeing the annoyance in that single eye had never disappeared. Smirking beneath his mask, the Namikaze slowly copied the famous Hitaki eye smile with both eyes. After opening them again he couldn't help but laugh out loud at the expression he could see on Kakashi's face. Perhaps going back to Konoha wouldn't be so bad, at the very least he could always enjoy seeing the look on many of the people's faces as he found ways to annoy them for a second first time. You know, Kakashi began in a seemingly conversational tone that set Urashi on edge. What? asked the blonde Namikaze. I just remembered. When we get back to the village Inochi is probably going to have to perform some mental checkups on you. Aha, uh -huh. your point being what exactly? Oh, it's nothing really Arashi-kun. Unless you consider the fact that if you're telling the truth, then you will have to become the head of the Namikaze clan. More than likely you're going to have to suffer through weeks of tedious paperwork upon your clan being revived, and probably marriage proposals and the like. In short, politics. As Arashi processed what he had just heard the Namikaze knew only one way to react. The last Namikaze, the second super pervert, ex-Anbu captain, and son of Hokage, dropped to his knees on the desert sand and raised his head towards the sky before releasing a scream full of despair. Wait just a second right there, Arashi said as he interrupted a story Naruto had been telling Sakura of his training with Jiraiya. He still wore the leather armored mask that reminded the two conscious members of Team Kakashi of the cloth one their teacher was never seen without. The Genin and Shunin each had different takes after they had first seen the strange man with it on. Naruto was slightly annoyed that he never thought of buying a mask like Kakashi's so that he could annoy the eternally late Jonin. While Sakura on the other hand had threatened the Namikaze with, and quote, a Tsunade level reaction to Jiraiya peeping in on her taking a bath if he ever started reading Icha Icha in public, causing all the men to pale in fear for several heartbeats, until the Namikaze had commented on how it strangely turned him on, and how he would never sully his hands with the, outdated literature, that was Icha Icha. He pushed you off the side of a cliff, not knowing if you would survive I must add, and all because he wanted you to call up some of the Kyubi's tailed beast chakra? Well yeah, I guess. Why, were you thinking that's a stupid thing for him to have pulled on a kid, Naruto asked the child of his hero, the Yandaimi Hokage. Arashi shook his head before smirking back at the Uzumaki, stupid? Are you sure you came out of that all right kid? Because that is 100% brilliant and exactly what I would have done to a student of mine. What? Deaf too? Ah forget it Naruto, not like I even had a student to teach, but you better not say that from an outside point of view, the whole thing is really something funny, nay? The younger of the group's two blondes looked back over his shoulder with his eyes scrunched together in on of his usual expressions. A huge foxy grin came to replace the weird look he had before the blondes suddenly turned in midair, landing on a tree branch and facing the Namikaze trailing several meters behind him. Crossing his arms across his chest Naruto opened his electric blue eyes as his feet pushed off from the tree branch. Now moving backwards the knuckled-headed Genin was not surprised to see the varied reactions from the members of their two-team group. His eyes turned to his right and caught Sakura's amused expression as the pink-haired Kunoichi brought a hand up to stifle a giggle. Beaming that he had made his teammate and crush have a positive reaction to his antics Naruto turned to look at his Jonin sensei. And nearly lost his footing on another branch after seeing the silver-haired Jonin reading one of Jiraiya's novels. Both Lee and Guy were overjoyed at seeing such a, youthful, action in what they saw as Naruto training his awareness of his surroundings. The younger of two even twisting to perform the same action as his blonde friend with his sensei crying anime tears at being unable to do the same with Kakashi on his back. Ten Ten and Neji both had equal looks of mild displeasure as each knew that once they had returned to the village it would only be a matter of time before both Guy and Lee had their team all traveling through the forest of death backwards. Naruto took all of this with the same grin still plastered to his face. It only disappeared once he locked eyes with a pair of now ice-cold cobalt blue eyes glaring at him. Surprised at the shift in the elder blonde's expression Naruto could not help but squirm slightly under the piercing glare. It felt like the glares that Sasuke used to give him at the start of Team 7's ninja career and Naruto decided he wanted to know why. Hey! Why are you giving me that look? The Namikaze responded by pointing a finger at Naruto before speaking, because that is pathetic and insulting. What was that? You heard me loud and clear fishcake, 
Arashi said in a disgruntled voice. It's pathetic what you're doing. What if we walk into an ambush because you happen to be goofing off like that? Or worse, what if you were fall off and knock your head on one of these branches and putting yourself out? Oi. I admit I may have done that as a kid, but I'm a lot better than I was back then. I won't fall into a trap, so shove it. The two blondes glared fiercely at one another for several moments in a contest, both trying to force the other to break contact first. In the end the contest ended before a winner could be determined as Naruto misplaced a landing and began flailing his arms to prevent himself from falling. He quickly regained balance as the rest of the group quickly passed him by and was about to take off again when he felt a firm grip on his shoulder. Looking at the many seals tattooed to the bare forearm, some made of ink and others of what appeared to be blood, Naruto raised his face to look up into that of the Namikaze. While Konoha's most infamous prankster would never be heard saying it, Naruto was in awe of the fact that he was in the presence of the Yandaimi Hokage's son. The day after teams Guy and Kakashi returned to Sanagakure with its case cage the blonde quickly asked Sakura about what Arashi had told them when they first encountered him. After his question had resulted in the back of his receiving a lighthearted bump from his pink-haired teammate, he had never been so glad that she didn't have great enough chakra reserves to stay as active as long as he could, the medic decided to answer him. Naruto admitted to himself in private that he had barely paid much attention to what had been said before the Namikaze had spoken to him and then promptly slumped over his smaller frame. He was surprised to discover just who had been drooling all over his back on the march back to Suna was. That he was the son of the very same man Naruto idolized, and who died to seal the Kyubi within him. At first he had been ecstatic when Sakura had told him that and ranted about seeing if the Namikaze knew any other jutsu his father invented that Jiraiya didn't know about considering that the man had to have been old enough to learn something from the hero. After he had turned to his friend, Gera the Gondem Kei's cage, after the red-haired had said something Naruto remembered something Ero Senen had told him. The self-proclaimed, super-pervert, had told his latest pupil how someone traditionally became a Jinchuriki. Naruto was somewhat subdued as he learned that most containers of the various tailed beasts were usually connected to the reigning village leader in some way or another, with the most common connection being one of blood. As an example the Toad Sanin brought up Gara to better impart the information to his rarely attentive student. Naruto had been entirely unaware of the fact that the boy he had met during the Chunin exams was in fact the son of the Yandaimi Kei's cage himself. As he came back to the present and again looked over the red and black beneath a Suna flak jacket, Naruto felt a spike of anger rise inside of him. Instinctively he forced the emotion down along with the faint trace of the foul chakra until he was certain that the fox inside of him couldn't attempt a second try at taking over. After doing that he silently simmered, while glaring directly into a slightly shocked Namikaze whose mouth was slightly agape, and utterly unaware that Arashi had detected what had just happened. Inside the safety of his mind Naruto screamed as his glare grew slightly hateful. The young Uzumaki was angry at the older blonde standing within arm length of him and although he felt that he was being unfair it was impossible to let the anger simply go. Naruto was resentful of Arashi and what he knew for an undeniable fact made them different. The Yandaimi had chosen to seal the Kyubi into a newborn baby in spite of already having a son alive by that time. Is there something on your mind Uzumaki? Arashi asked seriously while his eyes held a hint of understanding behind the cobalt blue of them. The older man brought up a hand to cup his chin for a moment while the fingers glanced off the side of a cheek. The teen blinked before the anger was replaced, but as Arashi looked into the electric blue he could see that within the maelstrom of hidden emotions that the eyes allowed a glimpse of it still lived, with a particular grin that both a Chunin instructor and dead cage had unfortunately been quite familiar with. As he formed the ram hand seal Naruto gathered and molded his chakra for something he had not used for a fair amount of time. I can't do much about why the Yandaimi picked me over him, but I can do this. Around the immediate area of the pair bursts of smoke came into existence and revealed three dozen cage bunchons of Naruto, all making the ram seal themselves. With a smirk that promised more payback in addition to what he was about to do Naruto and his clones all called out, Haremu no Jutsu, Ninja Harem. As the words were spoken Arashi suddenly lost his serious look and took on a near-perfect copy of one of Jiraiya's most perverted grins as the many Naruto's were all covered by smoke. A trickle of blood began landing on the tree branch as the smoke dissipated and over three dozen blonde pigtailed women clung to his body, although to his disappointment smoke hid the more interesting areas. 
The blonde man mentally began taking notes about how he could work Naruto's technique into his next novel. The jutsu offered up a multitude of possibilities and was easily as pure literature gold as Guy was obsessed with the flames of youth, or Kakashi with Icha Icha. Turning to look in the direction of the original Naruto hanged woman Arashi had a shine in his eyes. Naruto this is brilliant. I must learn the inner workings of this jutsu at once. The woman blinked once before, her jaw fell in shock. The sheer potential that it has for research purpose, Urashi continued on as more blood dripped down his face. Suddenly his eyes widened and the trickle became even larger as an idea came to mind. Sweet Kami. I could create an army of Tsunades with this. Ha! Huh? Jiraiya I have once again had a brilliant idea before you. Meanwhile in the Hokage Tower, Senju Tsunade continued to stare with a rising urge to cry at the horror of what lay before her. Taking advantage of the rarity of actually finishing a monstrous stack of paperwork before her former apprentice could bring her a fresh pile the slug princess had decided to indulge in one of her greatest weaknesses. Top Quality Sake The blonde-haired medical legend had just pulled out a bottle of said sake when disaster struck. She sneezed before a single drop of sake had been poured into her saucer. The result had been the nightmare that the mere sight ensured that she was on the verge of going into an unstoppable rage. Tsunade had thrown the bottle of sake out of one of the windows in her office, destroying the entire pane of glass as well as losing one of life's greatest wonders. At the same time in behind a fence guarding a hot spring situated in a well-off Kusa no Kuni city, a ceiling expert felt like he had lost out on something of epic proportions. The feeling was quickly replaced by fear as Jiraiya realized that the voices on the other side of the fence had gone eerily quiet and a substantial killing intent was quickly growing. Putting on his most disarming face Jiraiya attempted to get out of danger, well hello all you fine Kusa ladies. I hear your country is gobbling up my latest novel, so might I offer up copies of said novel for each and every one of you in exchange for letting me go? The first blow landed when he pulled out a copy of his most recent work Icha Icha Tactics, apparently Icha Icha was only popular among the country's male population. Naruto continued to stare in horror as the older blonde continued to rant about how brilliant his original jutsu was. He knew that his mouth was still hanging open in a mix of horror and disappointment at the sight of the utter ineffectiveness the technique had in regards to the namikaze. So far no man had ever been able to resist the jutsu and it was capable of bringing down a hokage multiple times over. Urashi was entirely uncaring as to what thoughts were running through the mind of his other self regarding the jutsu he was currently enjoying. A small part of his mind was ranting about how stupid he had been for not creating a similar jutsu for his own use. While he was highly intelligent and capable shinobi, the slight ego he allowed boosted much more, Urashi knew he couldn't copy a jutsu like that without help. After all, he was only engaged to an Uchiha prodigy, he had no chance of gaining something like the Sharingan. Bearing the direction his train of though was moving towards, Urashi knew he would have to ask for help. Ask for help. From his younger, orange-wearing, and unthinking self. Now that I think about it, it's not really something I really need to know about, I don't have to ask for help from, well myself of all people. Kami, that is still confusing as hell to wrap my mind around. Besides, it's not like knowing how to hinge my own cage bunchen into hot girls is something that will really help out against someone as determined as Madara. I mean, it's not like these are solid wait a minute. Urashi felt the blood in his veins chill to ice cold temperatures, he knew that his skin had turned a ghostly pale, and according to Itari his right eyebrow should be twitching somewhat. He knew that they were the clear signs of him going into a mild panic attack. Already his heart was pounding from inside his chest just as Arashi had realized something that threatened to make him lose what little food he had consumed in Suna just under a day ago. Still, the Namikaze could still ask his Uzumaki double and pray that he was wrong about his assumptions. Naruto, Arashi ground out slowly and with a trace of fear lining the edge of his voice. These girls, they're not, well solid are they? Naruto, blinked twice with, his, cute and innocent baby blue eyes. Where was Arashi getting at with that question? Regardless, he decided to answer his fellow blonde's question, well yeah. For some reason, all my henges are the real deal. Nothing illusionary about them all, why? Arashi stood there in horror for several moments as what he had just heard slowly sank its way in. He was surrounded by fully transformed copies of Uzumaki Naruto. Meaning they were fully transformed copies of a younger version of him. 
which meant that he was being turned on and thinking like the super pervert that he was, he was acting perverted towards himself of all people. Immediately Arashi felt the blood trickling from his nostrils come to a complete and sudden halt at the same instance that he felt a sense of nausea threaten to overwhelm him. Oh! Oh! Sweet Kami! Arashi suddenly broke free of the grasp of the three dozen pigtailed, and once deliciously sexy, blonde, girls. And his face took on a green look. Clutching at his stomach with one hand, and covering his mouth with the other, Arashi fell to his knees on the branch. Naruto, seeing the sudden change in the older blonde man quickly dispelled both the henge and his cage bunshin. In a second the younger teen was at the namikaze's side and on his knees as well, a look of bewilderment and worry etched onto his face. Running a hand furiously through his blonde spikes Naruto could only say one thing, you're supposed to have been blown away by a nosebleed, not get sick. Oh man, my jutsu isn't supposed to do this. At the word, jutsu, Arashi knew he could not hold back anymore. The cries of one disgusted and surprised Genin mixed with the heaving sounds of one ex Anbu captain and echoed throughout the forest. Far away from the blonde duo, the Icha Icha addicted Janin that was Hitaki Kakashi looked up from the page in his latest book as his ears picked up a far off and strange sound. Blinking his one visible eye twice, the silver haired leader of Team Kakashi craned his neck so that he was looking in the direction where they had left Naruto and Arashi behind. Something caught your attention, Kakashi? questioned made a guy as he looked up at the man he was carrying on his back. Shaking his head once, the Hitaki turned back to continue from where he had left off, an eye smile already in place, no no, guy, nothing at all. Inside the confines of his mind, Kakashi was cackling evilly as an image of the pair of blondes being chased by a rather large and fearsome predator popped into his mind. Nobody who threatened to burn his precious would ever get off lightly. Kakashi knew Kami herself wouldn't let karma fail to punish Arasi for what threatened the cosmic balance of that was right in the world. The sole surviving student of Namikaze Minato giggled, partly from finishing an especially brilliant page and partly from imagining the embarrassment or pain being suffered by the supposed Namikaze clan heir. Several hours later Guy, whom was in charge being the most senior and capable shinobi present, had decided to set up camp for the night. He had been conversing with his fellow Jonin and both men came to an agreement to rest for the night before continuing on in the morning. The respite from the pace being set by the quirky taijutsu master was well received by Sakura and, to a lesser extent, Neji and Ten Ten. All Konoha ninja present in the camp soon went about a multitude of basic tasks to set up a sufficiently defendable perimeter for their temporary stop. Sakura herself was sitting besides her perpetually late team leader the latter of which was currently resting in the center of the inside of a dead and slightly hollowed out tree trunk. Of all the shinobi it was her first sensei who was in the worst shape, although the cause was primarily due to chakra exhaustion from overusing his implanted Sharingan eye. The 18-year-old Kunoichan field medic had forcibly made the Hitaki request a quick in-field examination of his current physical state. The tried and true methods of dealing with depleted chakra reserves were either long periods of rest, or the swallowing of a soldier pill. The sole female of Team Kakashi, however, refused to go another day without personally making sure her sensei only required one of the two, and did not have an undetected injury or condition that the Suna medics may have accidentally missed. After having ordered her patient to remove his flak jacket, she caught sight of a flash of what looked like a necklace for just a second beneath his black shirt. Sakura then told him that he was not allowed to read anything while she worked on him. After doing basic checks that any ninja could do Sakura stood up from her place besides her sensei and walked around behind him. Folding her legs beneath her, the pink-haired Kunoichi's hands began to glow with a faint green chakra. Placing the glowing hands against her sensei's back Sakura prepared herself to perform a basic diagnosis jutsu, the very first Tsunade-sama had taught her in fact. Closing her aqua green eyes for a moment Sakura took in a short breath of air before she began to ply her recently learned skills as a medical nin. The immediate actions that would detect any ailments in the human body required the kunoichi to enter a shallow self-induced trance before she could truly use any of the jutsu she had learned. Medical ninjutsu was perhaps one of hardest of all jutsu branches to gain true mastery over. In fact only the sealing arts were arguably closer to impossible to master. Medical ninjutsu required perfect chakra control and the learned ability of having absolute knowledge over all aspects of the human anatomy, 
as well as total control of the medic's own mind in conjunction with the body at all times. It was for this reason why very few medical nins had anything above average chakra capacity and reserves. The actual use of medical ninjutsu however, was not as set in stone as the requirements were. Each and every medic regardless of nation or village had their own unique method of using their life-saving jutsu. Sakura could not count the dozens of lectures that Tsunade had given her that involved pounding, occasionally there had been times when it nearly became literal, the statement into her very being. The Hokage's first apprentice, the Jonin Shizun, had comforted the girl in the early beginnings of her training by telling Sakura that all medical ninja had gone through the same thing courtesy of their teachers, then Tsunade had ordered Shizun to try her best at a nearly impossible task, inspecting all hot springs in the village to make them pervert proof. The slug Sanin then warned Sakura not to speak of her with anything less than what she deserved as her teacher in Hokage. Tsunade had told her second apprentice that her own style mainly revolved around creating a mental image of a great tree in her mind. The tree was her patient and she would will her chakra to enter the tree and inspect it from the inside out. Shizun linked her own method with a chemical lab, using her chakra to find the right balances of everything just like when making her poisons. The Kunoichi's own best friend, Yamanaka Ino once mentioned hers as envisioning a massive field of innumerable flowers, and then finding any dead or sick plants for removal or healing. Every single medical ninja that Sakura had found in Konoha all had their own unique methods that worked for them only, she was no exception to the rule. Haruno Sakura, to be more precise the one she had been after graduating the academy, had prided herself greatly on her accolated book knowledge. The young girl she had been at that point in her life really only had them as her sole advantages over other fresh genin until Tsunade-sama had returned to the village. Despite improving her abilities as a true kunoichi by spades in the three years since then, and she considered herself blessed to have been that lucky, Sakura had never foregone that love of books. Honestly it had never once surprised her that her mental image was that of a medical journal containing all the medical information she had garnered since becoming the second apprentice to the slug Sanin. While she healed a patient's injured body, the book Sakura created would be missing lines or paragraphs, or even whole pages. Sakura would fill those missing blanks with the knowledge she had memorized and then begin the process of willing her chakra to heal and mend any injuries. The rosette-haired woman continued to take in breaths of air in a constant pattern as she began turning the pages in her mental book. A detached portion of her mind thought it fitting, in a sad and mildly funny way, that the book had a familiar orange cover. Thankfully the only thing inside the book were volumes of medical knowledge accumulated over the majority of her ninja career instead of the porn her perverted sensei so coveted that was written by her other teammates own, even more so than the famed copy nin, perverted sensei. Was it some kind of unspoken law that required several famed Konoha shinobi to be either openly or secretly perverts? Sakura soon turned her mind back towards the pages of information she looking for anything that was out of place that would show whether or not Kakashi was hiding something that he, the man may have been brilliant but he was only qualified for basic first aid at best when it came to things medical, thought was nothing. She would be damned if her team lost yet another member because of a stupid decision on her watch. Sasuke's desire for vengeance she could understand to a certain degree, and maybe the girl she had been may have thought he had every right to follow his own way, but the years since his desertion had showed her how much of a blunder the Uchiha boy had made. Both of the village's loyal Sanin were wary of taking direct action against Uchiha Itachi and she doubted Orochimaru could have given Sasuke the strength he would need to kill his elder brother. When one considered the information Jiraiya had found about the snake Sanin's involvement with the Akatsuki themselves it only added to how terrible a mistake her crush had long since made. According to the author of the damned staple book of perverts everywhere, it seemed that Orochimaru had attempted to murder Sasuke's brother the moment the traitor joined the organization with the Red Clouds, and lost to the then 13-year-old quite handily at that. Sakura was certain that had her wayward teammate been aware of that defeat he would have never joined up with someone who his brother had nearly killed. Damn it, the medic thought sourly as her concentration lapsed and she lost her place in the book. It's been years since he left us, and in that time we haven't heard even the slightest rumors about him or where Orochimaru is keeping him. Still though Naruto is back home now, and with him in the village it's only a matter of time before we actually start doing something to help find Sasuke. Sakura opened and then closed her eyes for the second time before resuming the jutsu. Yes, 
Naruto, Kakashi Sensei, and myself. Team 7 is definitely going to be back together soon, I just know it. So why then? Why is, despite knowing all of this, do I lose my focus whenever I think of Sasuke? Why is it that the pain I feel hasn't disappeared since the day Kakashi Sensei showed up carrying Naruto and only Naruto on his back? Mercifully the collected and calming words of her sensei reached her ears, Sakura. Blinking several times as her strained trance finally reached its end and she returned to reality it took the rosette several moments before she could form a cognitive response, simple as it was however, yes Kakashi Sensei. Turning his head 90 degrees to his right so that his soul visible eye was locked with her pair of aqua green eyes. The lone eye blinked once before curving into his trademark eye smile, she and Naruto were certain the Hitaki really would patent the look if ever allowed, that conveyed the nearly unnoticeable trace of awkwardness that filled the inside of the tree, while I'm certain many men would have absolutely no problem with having a young woman's hands on his body, I think your reason for having them on my back is surely done by now, right? I mean any longer and it would be considerate inappropriate behavior, after all you were one of my cute little genin once upon a time. Her reaction to the words was quite obvious and perfectly understandable. Immediately the kunoichi pulled her hands away from the janin's back as though they had been grazed by a mid-level kaiden jutsu. Indeed Sakura felt significantly hotter as she began to stutter out some kind of retort to her leader's words, her skin taking on a shade nearly the same as her own hair. The shade increased as her eyes soon moved on to stare for a moment at the blue cloth that hid his face from the world and imagined the handsome face she perceived to be beneath it. It was that thought that nearly caused her to say something embarrassing, and also forced her to duck her head down and grip her short pants tightly in her fists. Kami, she'd thought that she had outgrown that desire to see her teacher's face when she was taken off of his team to become Tsunade's apprentice, damn it. It seemed that the seemingly unobservant Kakashi had taken notice of his one-time student's state of being as he chuckled for a bit at how easily she was embarrassed when one knew just which buttons needed to be pressed. If there was one thing Kakashi missed about being a teacher it was those moments when he expertly, although according to one special Jonin, near diabolically, found and manipulated his team's unique personalities for his own amusement. It honestly was a pity that he'd so clearly proven to himself his inability to be a real teacher otherwise he would have taken another genin team just to obtain the same reaction Sakura was having. Soon the chuckling died down and the kunoichi's skin had lightened several shades nearer her own natural skin tone and he spoke again, so, I believe we are done her, yes. Why yes Kakashi sensei, you were right, you're perfectly fine aside from needing plenty of rest due to your rather severe case of chakra exhaustion. The silver-haired Jonin nodded once before slowly rising to his own two feet. Taking note of the slight, but still plainly noticeable, wobble to his movement Sakura quickly rose up to help her sensei. Looking down at the mass of pink the Hitaki couldn't help but roll his last biological eye, you don't have to do this Sakura. I can walk on my own. The look the group medic gave him reminded him of an angry Tsunade. Damn, there was no safe way to argue against that look. The rosette smiled innocently as her sensei capitulated to her whims, and Kakashi knew there was nothing innocent behind it at all. He had been around enough medics to know just what that look meant. It had been the same look Rin had when she first treated Minato sensei after he received a serious wound before he had managed to perfect either of his most famous jutsu. A look that was meant to hide the thoughts currently running through his former pupil's head. The thought that she had power over a weakened figure of authority, her team leader. With luck Sakura would turn out more like his own medic of a teammate and be less controlling than certain medical nin who let it start to mess with their minds. Moments later Kakashi was able to reach his flak jacket and weapons pouches near the entrance of the long dead tree. The Jonin did require some assistance from team Kakashi's sole female however. Kakashi could do nothing to stop the grin from appearing beneath his cloth face mask as he noticed how quickly Sakura could switch from embarrassed to controlling and then back to embarrassment. Deciding that he had embarrassed the kunoichi enough for the moment Kakashi opened his mouth, um. Hey Sakura, I don't suppose you could go and check with Guy. See if blonde number one and blonde number two are back yet. Mentally thanking her sensei for the obvious exit he had given her to stop the awkwardness that helping him had caused, Sakura quickly nodded. Turning to leave the tree, Sakura took off to find the most eccentric ninja she had ever met in her life. 
Before leaving however she looked over her shoulder at her sensei, she soon sweat dropped at the sight. Kakashi had once again taken a seat and pulled out the new copy of his favorite novel series that Naruto had given him. That was what, 50 seconds since I finished with him. Kami, what is so damned interesting about that little book? From what Naruto told me it's just page of smut after smut with just enough plot to qualify as a novel anyway. Mentally sighing, Sakura faintly smiled at the sensei who had changed the least out of the old Team 7 before turning around to leave at last. Silently counting, Kakashi put his precious reading material down after reaching 10. The Hitaki continued to observe the spot the medic had just recently been standing on. Cocking his head to the right slightly Kakashi soon developed an eye smile. Hum, I give her, a 9 out of 10 for the ass. Immediately his eye opened in shock at the thought he had just had, as though it was not his own. Looking down at the little green book in his hand the Sharingan wielder swore the pages were laughing at him. Sighing, Kakashi decided his perverted thought in regards to the pink-haired woman was the result of him unfortunately spending too much time reading Ika Ika. Seriously, 18 though Sakura may be, he needed to get laid if he was starting to think about one of his students in that way. No matter how attractive a woman she obviously becoming. Perhaps in a year or two. Damn, another stray perverted thought. Shrugging his shoulders a second later and Kakashi was back to reading his new favorite book. Lord Jiraiya had really outdone himself with the latest Ika Ika. Alone in the hollowed remains of a tree, perverted giggles could be heard coming from Hitaki Kakashi. I can't believe I had to toss away my jacket you bastard. Uzumaki Naruto shouted indignantly at the older blonde whose arm was wrapped around his neck and he was supporting. After moving to help the apparently ill Namikaze, out of the kindness of his heart the ramen obsessed teen added, he was rewarded by having the misfortune of taking the place of a bucket for the very green son of a Hokage. He was now clad in the plain black t-shirt that he kept under his favorite jacket. That jacket had been something his more perverted teacher had given him, and now Naruto had lost one of the few gifts he had ever received in his difficult life and all because he was trying to be helpful. Such betrayal on the part of Arashi demanded compensation, and Naruto would extract his payment in a week-long ramen binge at Ikiruka's courtesy of the elder blonde's wallet. What made it worse was that some of the Namikaze's regurgitated meal had caked the necklace that Ba-chan had given him. Despite how sick, sick enough that he considered just putting it in a storage seal, it may have been Naruto had cleaned it as best he could before placing it around his neck again. A loud and painful groan was the first response and was soon followed by a rather undignified attempt at intimidation, fishcake. If you value your life you had best shut up before I kill you. Naruto snorted before sticking his tongue at the other blonde, considering that you're looking weak enough that a night alone in this forest could kill you, I really ain't all that intimidated by that threat. Arashi lifted his head to glare half-heartedly at his fellow self. Smirking in a way that showed he had a plan to back up his earlier statement, that might indeed be true, Naruto. Unfortunately for you kid, I can see quite a few problems with you doing that. The Uzumaki raised an eyebrow at the words. Looking up into the sky he could see that they were losing sunlight, maybe half an hour before the sun set in the forest. To compensate for his sick companion, Naruto had decided it would be best to catch up with the other Konoha Nin by walking on the forest floor. No matter how angry he was, and for multiple reasons too, at Arashi it paled in comparison to how bored he could get. With that in mind he decided to continue the conversation they had just started, and would Mr. Puke all over my shirt please tell me what he thinks I may have missed. Really, that's the best you could come up with. What? Oh hell no. I just don't want the guy who made me lose my favorite jacket trying to steal the creativity going through this head of mine. You give yourself way too much credit fishcake. In my experience there are only a few people alive at any given time who should ever be allowed to run their mouths. And you know what, they all happen to have a knack for spotting the perfect moment to drop some subtle or over the top statements that show that they are either insane or insanely brilliant. What's being insane have to do with me having anything cool to say? You admitting you're insane then fishcake. Wow, it took me weeks to say that myself. Oi, I am not in weight. You're insane. Of course kid. Insanity is just another word for people everyone thinks are lacking a few things upstairs, but are usually the ones who become famous worldwide. Or was that infamous? Anyway, I happen to have gone insane a few times I think. 
Enough times that I'm not totally aware if I happen to be normal right now, or if I have reached that point of insanity where I believe that I am sane. And it's people like that that everyone has to watch out for. Naruto looked up slightly at the man who was steadily regaining the color he had lost while ruining the younger blonde's orange stripped jacket. Until he returned to Konoha, and until he got some answers regarding the furball, Naruto refused to let the matter go. He worried that if he didn't then he might ask the Namikaze the questions he wanted to know, and that the answers might lead to a fight between them. If it came to that Naruto wanted the fight to be after Aero Senen had given a few more people the seals that had stopped the Kyubi's chakra from taking over his mind and body. With that in mind Naruto smirked before opening his mouth and speaking a way to hide the still present anger he felt, ha. Huh. If you really are insane then I shouldn't trust what you're saying to me. This means that there really isn't anything stopping me from leaving you in the forest alone while I get to catch up with my friends and sleep by the warm campfire they'll probably have set up when I get there. It was Arashi's turn to offer a snort in response to a blonde ninja's words. Shaking his head in amusement the son of the Yandaimi Hokage began to speak in a chiding tone, maybe, but you can't leave me behind if I'm the one with that right fishcake. And that, Naruto, is the first problem I see with you leaving me alone. Mind saying that what the hell? Naruto finished shouting as he separated from Arashi and barely managed to avoid receiving a kanai in his kidneys. As it was he did not avoid the light cut from the sharpened blade as Arashi managed a second slash. Not willing to chance any closer strikes, the youngest of the pair quickly brought his hands up to make the hand seal needed for a second use of cage bunshin. The two clones he made were quickly taken down after Arashi delivered an upward slash at one with his tri-prong kanai while elbowing the neck of the other. The split-second action allowed Naruto to create some distance between him and his assailant. Flipping the kanai in his hand so that the blade was perpendicular to the ground he was standing on, Arashi smoothly moved into a basic guard stance. Without any additional movement he created two of his cage bunchen on either side of him. The blonde man and his four clones each had the same amused and taunting grin on their faces. Together they began to speak, the next time you decide to carry an unknown shinobi, never assume that what you are seeing of them is real. Deception is the unchanging universal aspect shared by all ninja no matter their home. That was part one of the first problem I noticed, you mistakenly assumed that just because I am the son of Hokage that I would not pose any threat to Konoha soldier. You clearly forgot that I am still at the moment a nuke nin. Growling in the back of his throat Naruto formed three times as many of his own bunshin. The two sides continued to stare unflinchingly at the other as the sun continued to set behind Arashi. A grim smile came over Naruto's face as he narrowed cobalt blue eyes and drew his own kanai, an action quickly followed by his own force of clones. The smile soon turned into a feral smirk reminiscent of a fox's, you know what. This is the perfect excuse that I can use to really make you miserable. Across from him Arashi had an equally foxy grin plastered to his face. Behind that grin however he was methodically taking in as many details as he could discern from Naruto. This world's version of himself was clearly unaware of his heritage considering how surprised he had been upon hearing that the name of the Yandaimi Hokage was Namikaze Minato. That was confirmed when Kakashi and Guy had exchanged looks when he had mentioned the boy's heritage. In his travels after becoming a missing ninja Rashi had taken time to learn more about the world, including as much as he could about Jinchuriki of other nations. He had discovered that it was disgustingly common for the containers of the tailed beasts to often become little more than mindless weapons for their respective homes, few actually having any real sense of free will. Naruto was obviously the container for Kyubi, any doubts Arashi privately held had been crushed when he felt the fox's chakra leaking from the genin. It was also equally obvious that he was not some kind of mindless weapon of mass destruction. Combined with his lack of knowledge regarding his parentage pointed to him being ignored by the shinobi forces of the leaf, and quite possibly the civilian population of the village as well. Naruto knew Cage Bunshin, he knew the Rasengan, and he was on the way to becoming a master of the sealing arts. By his age Arashi had been in Anbu Black Ops, and Naruto was still a genin who he doubted had more than three years of experience at most. With all the potential the younger him had it was maddening that he was at such a low station. Arashi needed to see for himself what the village had done to Naruto by not paying much attention to him. He hoped that it was just ignoring him anyway, can he help any who had harmed the boy in his younger years. 
The Namikaze also wanted to see how much control he had over the biju inside of him as well. And if Uzumaki Naruto was anything like him, then the best way to find anything out was through a fight. That in mind Arashi allowed the grin to shrink in size before opening his mouth to speak one last time before they began fighting, well Naruto. I'm sure Kakashi Nisan probably says this to you and your lovely teammate, he continued on through the indignant shout, but I think he'll say it anyway. Come at me with the intent to kill. Duck the roundhouse kick, roll left and avoid Rasengan to the back. Drop to the ground and allow the shuriken to fly overhead and strike two cage bunshin. Push off the ground then raise left kanai up to catch the downward slash at the purposely exposed back. Use right kanai to parry a second clone's assault to the right then disengage with the bunshin behind. Allow the clone to lose balance and step forward and into its brother. Jump away from the two recovering bunshin and throw an explosive tag between them. Turn 180 degrees and throw the left and right kanai into a pair of clones charging up an Odama Rasengan. Run through the smoke left behind by the two's dispelling and form a pair of futon cage bunshin. Grab the clone nearest and hurl it up and towards the forest canopy. The second futon clone steps out of the smoke and into an ambush of five cage bunshin. Perform substitution with the cage bunshin underground. Wait three seconds, hear the massive burst of air pressure, then burst out of the ground and latch onto the original. Open palm jab towards left elbow, curse silently as it bursts into smoke, draw handful of shuriken then throw at the incoming hostile shuriken. Don't wait for the long range weapons to connect, instead draw a single kanai with the right hand then leap into the trees. Catch the flicker of movement in the periphery of the left eye, shift stance and brace for the collision. The ring of shuriken striking shuriken echo as the throne clone connects head first with left side. Grit teeth as the sound of cracking ribs is heard and spin on the right foot to parry three throne kanai in rapid succession. See electric blue move behind a thick tree for cover then raise kanai to mouth. Form three cage bunshin and one futon cage bunshin to counter charge the rushing dozen enemy clones. Channel wind chakra into kanai and watch as it forms a makeshift scimitar. Launch forward towards the tree where the original uses as cover and pull back right arm, lean towards the left and avoid a Rasengan from a single bunch and then form another clone to deal with it before jumping off another branch, and slash diagonally across the three. Watch as the massive obstacle is cleanly cut in half and falls to the ground. Widen eyes at the incoming cage bunch and covered in exploding tags. React by using a Kawerimi with the one futon cage bunch as the grinning clone closes in. Watch as the futon cage bunshin is caught in a bear hug by the enemy bunshin. Fall backwards and stick to the underside of a tree branch to avoid a pair of Odama Rasengan attacks. Cease chakra flow to feet and free fall to the forest floor as the top half of the tree is annihilated. The futon cage bunshin detonates at the exact moment as the exploding tagged bunshin does, combing with it to create a powerful outward rush of wind. Curl into a ball as the wind collides and feel the sting of dozens of deep burning cuts before the burst of air arrives and plummet to the ground. Take the fall on the right arm and avoid breaking already cracked ribs on the left side. Maintain grip on kanai and fight through the immediate pain then lash out with a kick to catch a blur of black and orange. Smirk at the connection and cry of pain before quickly rolling left and bring kanai into an upward slash. Hear the wind being cut by the weapon and feel warm drops of liquid splatter over a Sunagakar flak jacket. See the opponent hastily leap away before placing a hand over his bleeding left shoulder. Do not relax guard after seeing him take cover behind a tree once again. Allow the wind to disperse from the kanai before channeling it once again to add speed and sharpness to the blade, and then aim for the shine of metal atop the head before throwing. Revel in the flash of fear before narrowing eyes as a trio of cage bunshin forms a shield halfway between the opponents. Step to full height before crossing arms over chest. Tilt head to left side as the anger coming from behind the tree could almost be tasted in the air. Is that the best you can do fish cake? I'm really disappointed in what you're turning out to look like. I could have kicked your ass when I was only 10 for Kami's sake if this is all you can do. Naruto narrowed his eyes as his ears picked up the words he knew were meant to goad him into preemptive action. It was something the blonde Jinchuriki wanted nothing more to do and he had to force himself to remain behind what protection the tree could afford him at the moment. He winced in pain before looking at the most severe injury he had obtained in his fight with Arashi. 
Crimson lines streamed past his fingers and rivulets of blood fell to the ground. Naruto strained to flex the fingers on his left hand. To his great and utter disappointment the most that he could do with the appendage was a simple twitch. Groaning Naruto paid no attention to the small amount of pain he felt as soon as he hit the back of his head on tree bark. The injury wasn't even that bad but it had destroyed the nerves connecting his arm and brain together. All around him he could hear the taunting voice echo throughout the forest as Arashi said in a sing-song tone, Oh Yuzumaki Fishcake, won't you come out from behind that tree and play with me? Is that little paper cut I gave you bothering you too much? If it is, I promise you that I can make it go away, all you have to do is let me cut the arm off at the shoulder and bam. You have a whole new pain to keep your mind off it. Aren't I so nice? The Uzumaki felt a warm line of something slide down his jaw and tasted something hot and irony. He soon noticed a very small pain and found that he had unconsciously bit down on his lip to keep from responding. Naruto needed to think up a plan to win while at the same time fighting off the mindset he had that preached head on attack. Painfully learned first-hand experience taught him had shown him how suicidal anything direct would be against the man. The man was fast, as fast as Lee had been after opening the first several inner gates during the Chunin exam's preliminary round, he was at least twice as physically powerful as Naruto, had a great deal of energy, and he had chakra control down to nearly the same level as Sakura. Why don't we hurry this up fishcake? I think I've killed enough poor trees, and taken the homes of enough innocent forest creatures for one night by now. And the man had yet to stop taunting him. Not even Sasuke's fangirls had ever taunted him as long as Arashi had been, even when he made a major fool of himself. It was like the man was purposely trying to make him angry, hell he probably was. To make matters even worse, Naruto was virtually unaware of any of the man's jutsu. All Arashi had done while fighting Naruto was use a mix of taijutsu, some kenjutsu, bunshin techniques, kawarimi, and that weird thing he did with a kunai. Channeling chakra into the tri-prong kunai and creating a long blade of wind was amazing. Then there was that crazy variation of the cage bunshin his opponent was using. Somehow Arashi was able to create shadow clones that would not dispel with a puff of smoke like his own would. Instead his bunshin would basically explode and launch blades of wind everywhere before flattening everything within 20 meters. While Naruto was not the smartest of people, he could tell that the second aspect was caused by some kind of massive change in air pressure. Aside from those, Naruto had been told by Kakashi that Arashi also had some kind of teleportation jutsu that not even the Sharingan could keep track of. As far he could tell Arashi hadn't used his special kunai that way at all. It was insulting to know that the Yandaimi Hokage's son was obviously toying with him. The difference in skill level was insane, and Naruto knew he was way behind him in nearly every area. Naruto refused to give up even with that knowledge however. Surrender just was not his style and would never be no matter how appealing the prospect of doing so was to him. Naruto tried to move his left hand again and once again could only manage a twitch. He knew that the Kyubi could heal any injury he sustained when fighting, but that took time. Already he could feel the burning sensation caused whenever the fox, or he himself reluctantly, used its chakra and compass his entire left arm. The cut itself soon vanished although he knew that it would take at least five minutes before the nerves were replaced. That meant five minutes of fighting a man who could kill him whenever he chose with only one hand. Naruto moved his right hand for his weapons pouch and drew a handful of shuriken. If Bushy Brows could get up after having his arm and leg crushed while unconscious, then he could last five minutes easy. Pressing his back up against the tree Naruto channeled chakra into his legs before opening his mouth, screw you Arashi. And what you gave me was as far from a paper cut as I am from being a pervert. That really isn't doing much for what I'm thinking fishcake. Not much at all. Naruto moved away from the tree and used the chakra stored in his legs to launch him at Arashi's taller form. Upon seeing the smaller blonde come at him Arashi quickly brought the kunai in his right hand up to catch Naruto's own. The two blades connected before Arashi could fully channel chakra to his feet in order maintain a firm hold on the ground. Naruto's momentum was enough to knock the taller man off balance and surprised. Smirking, Naruto quickly tried to land a series of kicks against Arashi's torso. Not willing to loosen his hold on the kunai in his right hand, Arashi swiftly brought his left arm to block the barrage. 
That was when he heard the sound of shuriken moving through the air. The sound grew louder and closer until Arashi discovered that they were coming from a tree behind him. Smiling faintly at what Naruto had done, Arashi disappeared from his position in an instant. The cage bunshin who had attacked him with a kanai had a look of surprise on its face just before being riddled by the original shuriken. Hidden in the shadows of the forest canopy Naruto blinked before frantically looking for the location of the other blonde. Kit, behind us, hearing the warning being roared from within his mind, Naruto tried to avoid whatever Arashi was about to do. Unfortunately the fox's warning had been too slow and the Kyubi Jinchuriki cried out in pain. His eyes moved towards the source of the pain and saw the bloody steel of one of the triprong protruding halfway out of his previously wounded shoulder. With the span of only a second after registering that fact, Naruto felt something smash into his spine, dislocate the uninjured shoulder, and then stomp on the back of his ankles. Then he felt the cold steel of a kanai above his heart along with a feeling of nothingness. The owner of the kanai at his throat began to speak, I can't decide whether to feel impressed or disappointed right now, Naruto. He then felt an arm wrap around his neck ready to snap it in an instant. Naruto froze at how cold and almost mechanical Arashi's voice had gotten, and then could not help but widen his eyes as the man began leaking out a massive killing intent. The amount he was exuding was enough to make Naruto as helpless as when Team 7 had first met Momochi Zabuza so long ago in Wave. Fighting through the fear Naruto unwillingly allowed it to show in his words, W what are you talking about? The arm wrapped around his neck tightened substantially and cut off the flow of air into Naruto's lungs. He felt the kanai at his heart pierce the thin black material of his t-shirt and begin cutting away at it before Arashi began speaking again, what I mean, is that you are afraid of going all out. What are you? Naruto responded while struggling to breath. What are you talking about? I was going all out on you. The only way you could make that statement true, would be if you used what you keep inside you. I want to see it for myself. If you're talking about what I think you are, then you really are insane. The youngest of the pair felt something placed above his heart, Fuinjutsu, Keijiju Gudukaigo, sealing techniques, metaphysical joint meeting. Azumo Kamazuki and Katetsu Hagen remained on the edge of their seats while sneaking glances all around the temporary table placed in the gate check-in station. The two chunin were engaged in a six-way match of poker with several of Kanahagakur better-known ninja. Aside from the regularly assigned gate guards, the players included Mitarashi Anko, Serutobi Asuma, Yamanaka Inochi, and Yuahi Kuranai. Azumo being the more reserved of the two guards was immensely grateful that they had covered up the windows of the station. The match had started with a drunken bet the night before made by Kotetsu that Anko was terrible at card games. This led to Anko organizing a game the very next day of her own choice and she naturally chose the most embarrassing, strip poker. As it stood the only ones to have lost any clothes were Azumo, wearing only his pants, underwear, and sandals, and Kotetsu, in only his boxers and headband. Azumo turned to glare at his partner and best friend and the man responsible for the mess. He also gave a look that said, You idiot! Look at what you've done! Kotetsu sighed before nodding his head to accept the blame. The bandage-nosed Chunin returned the look of his friend with one that said, I know, I know. But I'm worse than you so shut it. Kurinai caught the exchange of looks between the Chunin and remembered her own experience of incorrectly accusing Anko of anything. Her friend had the nasty habit of taking things to the extreme and always found a way to make sure she never got the worst of a situation. The only time Kurinai could avoid anything too bad was whenever drinks were involved, and that was only because she could hold her drinks down better than the snake mistress. With that in mind she decided to give the two a short respite from what was going to inevitably befall them, so Anko. I hear you took on your first team of Genin recently. A stick of dango protruding from her lips, Anko turned to level a pupil-less look in the direction of one of her own friends. Placing her own hand face down she then raised a finger in a waiting gesture before quickly devouring her snack. The tokabetsu Janin soon took the dango skewer out of her mouth before throwing it behind her chair without aim, where the stick joined a collection of others in perfect representation of a garden snake chasing after a field mouse. Picking her hand back up she began planning her next move again while responding to words of the genjutsu mistress, yeah, I finally get my own team of brats. They are real easy to scare, 
Just show them one of my bigger summons and they provide a lot of entertainment. Especially your nephew Sarutobi. Asuma spat out the small sip of tea he had been drinking before falling into a coughing fit. Inochi, being the one closest to the man, began to lightly smack his back and allow the man to breathe normally again. Once he could speak again the Serutobi looked up fearfully, you left Konohamaru alone with a giant snake. Anko shot him a dirty look as though she had been insulted, no. Geez, what do take me for? Some kind of psychotic bitch, please. I reserved that for my day job, I made sure his two teammates were with him before I let Shushuku kun out to play with my brats. He's been very lonely lately, I'm not letting my baby out much anymore. He missed being around kids too apparently, though I don't know why. They didn't even start it interesting, as soon he showed up they just started running. Asuma looked like he was about to have a heart attack before he made to leave the table. Immediately both Azumo and Katetsu leapt over the table to force him back down. Struggling to hold down the John and Azumo spoke, Hell no Asuma. If we can't leave this there's no way you are. Let me go, I have to make sure my nephew hasn't been bitten yet. Kurinai blinked twice before turning to Anko and asking an unspoken question. Correctly determining what the question was Anko shook her head, actually Shushuku-kun isn't venomous. He prefers to find his prey and give them a nice, scaly, and clingy hug by wrapping around them, hear the special John inside before leaning back in her chair and looking wistfully at the ceiling, I remember when I used to fall asleep with him as my own personal pillow and living blanket. That's supposed to make me feel better how? Oh come on Sarutobi, give me a break. Besides, not like I'm the only Jonin instructor to potentially accidentally have killed a few of their batch, here right? Dead silence from the other three Jonin was her answer, along with different looks. Kurinai had palmed her forehead while muttering something about, only Anko, Inochi looked like he was trying to determine whether or not she was serious or joking, and Asuma looked downright terrified into submission. Narrowing her eyes Anko delivered a glare at her group of fellow upper level ninja, really. I'm joking here guys, I especially told my darling little baby snake not to eat any of bunch of brats, and threatened to keep him away from the forest of death as punishment. Inochi was the one who decided to respond that time, why would that stop one of your summons? Anko delivered a regretful look in return that surprised all but Kurinai, because my baby likes to stalk the forest for big meals. That's why I think he wouldn't have eaten any of my genin at all. Combine the three of them aren't enough meat for him to even be interested in snacking on. Asuma had no idea whether he felt reassured or even more worried for his nephew after that statement. Kotetsu, who had by that time fully restrained Asuma with aid from Azumo, looked up at one of the best of the T&I department. Putting on his best apologetic look the Chunin attempted to get out of the game he was losing, Hey um Anko, listen I'm really sorry about saying you sucked at cards cause you're a, a dango skewer grazed his left cheek and drew blood, beautiful and sexy woman. But I can see that you're much better than me or Azumo, so can't we call it even? Please, we need to get back to work, uh, guarding the check-in station, right Azumo? His friend nodded eagerly with his own desperate look. Anko took on a speculative thinking stance, her chin cupped in her left hand, while humming lightly at the same time pushing her own chair on its back legs and keeping perfect balance. Tilting her head to the left she smiled sweetly before shaking her head in a, no, statement. Azumo and Katetsu slumped in defeat and resignation before going back to their seats. Anko put on a devilish smirk as she looked at them like the snakes she summoned, sorry boys, but I don't listen to sore losers. Now, maybe if you actually won a hand I might consider ending the match, might being the key word. Besides, I seriously doubt that anyone will be coming by here in the next few minutes. As she turned her gaze back towards her hand of cards, the sound of claws desperately scratching against the wall caught their attention. Anko groaned at her poor luck while Kurinai giggled at how fitting the situation had become for her friend. Putting on her most frightening glare Anko stood up and pulled a kunai from her pouch before marching off towards the door. In the blink of an eye Anko had kicked the door off its hinges and thrown her kunai so that it would strike in the general abdomen area for most people. The thrown weapon struck nothing and the second sound to reach the ears of the players was that of ragged panting. The snake mistress looked in the direction of the sound and caught sight of a certain pug that looked about ready to drop dead and carried a scroll in its mouth. 
When the little Ninkan noticed he was being watched, he managed to get back on his feet and walk several steps before collapsing once he reached Anko's shadow. Looking up into the woman's face the pug dropped the scroll before giving Anko a look, I cover the distance between the borders of Hai no Kuni and Kei's no Kuni to home so I can deliver this message in half the time it normally takes at a good speed, and you people decide kicking a door at me is a proper thank you. Blinking owlishly, Anko soon rubbed the back of her head in embarrassment before taking another look at the pug. The little dog looked strangely familiar for some reason as she carefully scrutinized him before asking curiously, wait a minute, hold up. Haven't I met you before? Behind her the rest of the group of card-playing ninja got up and walked closer to see the pug. The Ninkan looked tiredly up at the collection of Shinobi and Kunoichi, doing a double take upon seeing Izumo and Katetsu and their amount of clothing, before snorting. Rolling its eyes the dog began to answer, Kakashi and me brought some spy or another to your department together about a year ago. Realization showed in Anko's eyes as she made an, oh sound. She had a faraway look in her eyes as the memory came back to her, that day had been an especially good day for Anko. Smiling wickedly she nodded her head energetically, I remember now. Pakun right, thanks for that by the way, he was a really fun guy to guy to break in. Odo Jonan are so afraid to talk to me, I just can't help but feel extra happy at the end of a good interrogation. Silence greeted her again, though the smiling snake mistress paid no notice. Realizing that her friend was in her own little world at the moment, Kurinai sighed before stooping down to pick up the message that Pakun had clearly pushed himself to deliver. As the red-eyed Jonan opened up the scroll Pakun yawned before speaking again, before I fall asleep, Kakashi told me to tell the guards, here he gave the aforementioned Chunin a weird look, that they would be about 15 minutes behind me and won't be stopping. Dropping its head to the ground a puff of smoke signaled that, with the completion of his mission, Pakun had returned to the realm of summons. As soon as the little dog was gone Kurinai found herself surrounded by the group of Jonan and Chunin. Anko had gotten behind her and placed her head on her friend's shoulder as she began reading as well. Only Kurinai, someone who knew her better than anyone else, noticed the snake mistress's faint trace of worry as they both silently read the message. It was Asuma who decided to open his mouth first when he saw his fellow John intense slightly when it looked like she had reached the end of the short and hastily written message, would you mind enlightening us as to what the message is Kurinai? With a hint of worry in her voice the Genjutsu mistress did just that, teams Kakashi and Guy are hurrying back to the village as we speak. They have two injured members, one of which is critical, and have apprehended a missing ninja from the village. Kakashi requests that both Hokage-sama and Inochi-san be at the hospital to meet them immediately. With a word of apology Inochi forced himself to her side where he took the scroll himself. Reading the message over with his own eyes, the long-haired clan head had a look of befuddlement on his face. Shaking his head slightly the older man turned to give a serious look at Kurinai, Kurinai, if you would accompany me as well. The only reason Hitaki would request my presence along with Hokage-sama's own would be if one of the two injuries is mental. If that is the case then I believe that there may be a chance that a powerful genjutsu may have been used. Your abilities would be most helpful in that situation. Nodding her head both Jonan disappeared in a swirl of leaves, and Anko landed face first on the dirt as shoulder she had placed her chin on was gone as well. Jumping back to her feet in an instant, all traces of humor on her face was lost as she quickly became more serious in regards to the situation. Her eyes followed the faint tracks left behind by Pakun and looked in the direction where the two Konoha teams were likely to be, injured members and prisoner in tow. I'd better go and stop my little test now. A traitor to the village, Ibiki won't be able to keep me away from that bastard. Especially if he happens to know anything about Orochimaru. Asuma, Knowing full well of Anko's pure hate towards all things traitor, nodded his head. As the snake mistress shunchened as well, the son of the Sandame Hokage delivered a level look at Azumo and Katetsu. The Chunin were as serious as the Jonin had been and had a professional look to them, you guys follow me. I know Kakashi and he is not the type of guy to send a message that far ahead of his team unless he had good reason. In other words we should react as though our comrades are being pursued by an enemy force and move accordingly. The three shinobi shared a look of understanding and moved to reinforce their fellow soldiers as one. The godaim Hokage, Tsunade of the Sanim, closed her eyes and again saw one of her ninja and felt helpless. 
Anyone who knew the blonde pigtailed woman would know that she absolutely detested the feeling with a burning passion. She had been helpless to save her lover and younger brother years earlier, and she was helpless to do anything for the team laid out on a bed in the Konoha hospital. Behind closed eyes, bright blonde spiky hair, whisker-like birthmarks, tanned skin, and unfocused electric blue eyes stared back at her. The closest thing to a son she would ever have in life and she was forced to hand over his care to a man more suited to helping the boy. If she hadn't felt helpless, then the situation would have been insulting to a woman who prided herself on medical ability. At the moment she was standing on one side of one of the village intelligence division's interrogation rooms. Flanking her on the left were her two apprentices, Sakura and Shizum, while to her right was her sole loyal teammate and fellow Sanim, Jiraiya. All had looks of worry as they each remembered the quiet that was so unusual for any room that the loudmouthed blonde Jenin was in. It was something that they all hoped they wouldn't have to experience for a long time after Naruto woke up. At least, Tsunade hoped he would wake up. After nearly a day of working around the clock Inochi was still no closer to reawakening the much younger blonde, and Genjutsu hadn't been used to put him in the state he was in, according to Yuahi Kurenai. The two did come up with a very plausible theory that whatever had been done to the village prankster was more than likely connected with the man on the opposite side of the one-way window. When the four of them first walked into the room, Jiraiya just about had a heart attack. Sitting strapped to a chair with Morino Ibiki, the head of Konoha's torture and interrogation unit, looming over him was a man wearing a dirty sleeveless red muscle shirt and black pants. The pervert of a seal master memorized the exact design of the near dozen seals tattooed to the prisoner's right arm, along with a dark blue tattoo on the left that forever marked a man as having served in Anbu Black Ops. But it was the man's face that caused the toad sage to need help from his Hokage of a teammate to calm himself and sit down. The face of a man whose passing left an ever open wound on Jiraiya's very soul, aside from the lack of blonde bangs lining his jaw that is. The spiky-haired and blue-eyed man with that same exact look on his face, the collected and certain smile that showed he was always aware and thinking ahead, with the face of Namikaze Minato. After forcing the white-haired man to stand in front of her, Tsunade specially told him to, close that mouth, take a seat, breath, and avert those eyes Jiraiya felt like he had reasonably level head. Up until the point that Tsunade, the easy-to-anger woman capable of leveling entire buildings with her fists, had to struggle to restrain him from entering the room and killing the self-proclaimed Namikaze. The second blonde-haired Hokage had never seen a look of unadulterated anger and murder in the eyes of her teammate in all their years than at that one moment. And as much as she wanted to join him in beating the man responsible for Naruto's present condition, the idea was as tempting as a bottle of good sake to her in that instance, the invisible weight of that ridiculous had made itself known to her. As Hokage it was her duty to find out whether or not the man had any information pertaining to either the Akatsuki or Orochimaru in the slightest, then they could slowly beat him to death in such a way that even Ibiki would find gut-wrenching. You guys want to know what I did to Fishcake? The voice brought both Sanin to a screeching halt. It was the first time since entering the room that they had heard the prisoner speak at all. Jiraiya had to close his eyes and mentally struggle to make he believe that it was a fake he was hearing because the voice sounded exactly like his deceased students. A mix of one part analytical, two part curious, one part confident and three part kind. It was a voice that had humbled the teacher by teaching him a new jutsu, the voice that had brought emotions of parental pride into the open, a voice which made him to be the child of prophecy in Jiraiya's eyes once upon a time. The Toad Summoner had never felt his fifty-plus years more than in that moment, nor the feeling of loss and failure at having had a hand in his greatest pupil's death. Tsunade caught the pained look of her teammate easily, and saw the barely noticeable shake in his body. Unconsciously Tsunade remembered her own deceased apprentice, a highly talented young Kunoichi by the name of Inazuka Rin, who by chance had been a student of Minato as well. It was one of the slug princess's few regrets that were always in the back of her mind. Tsunade had never been able to finish Rin's training as the young woman refused her offer to travel with her and Shizune when she first left the village. It was only after returning to take the title of Hokage that Tsunade discovered that Rin had gone on a mission nearly seven years earlier and was presumed dead along with the rest of the team she had been leading. With a look of understanding the blonde Hokage placed a comforting hand on her friend's shoulder. Jiraiya gave her a look of pure thanks in return. 
A slight cough caught their attention and the two Sanin turned to look at a smiling Shizun and a curious Sakura. Realizing what it may have looked like to her apprentices Tsunade quickly pushed the tall man away from her before returning her attention to the interrogation. Ibiki was only mildly surprised to hear the man speak for the first time. The current session had only begun half an hour earlier. The man was to be referred to as Arashi, due to the name being a part of two of the three different aliases the person had given teams Kakashi and Gai. The interrogator allowed the silence between him and the prisoner to last several more seconds before responding, the Hokage would like to know what happened to him. One of my co-workers would like to know what you did to him. Myself on the other hand, the man placed two items on the wooden desk separating him from Arashi. One was his dual slashed Kanahagakur headband, the other was a larger version of the standard ninja bingo book. The blonde man's gaze switched between focusing on the headband and book. His eyes showed that he knew exactly what his interrogator was going to say next. With a cruel smirk the heavily scared man looked down at the younger man, I want to know, just who you really are. Leaning back in his chair Arashi turned to stare at the one-way window where the four others were. Closing his eyes the blonde smiled a disturbingly accurate copy of the one Naruto always had whenever the teen revealed a new prank. Opening his eyes the Konoha nin saw challenging gleam shining behind their cobalt blue. The Naruto-like grin still present he turned to Ibiki and tilted his head up to meet the older man's gaze, well if you say pretty please with a smile on that face of yours or, and this would get me to reveal my deepest darkest secrets, a pair of busty women, one blonde and red, to come in here wearing a skimpy two-piece bikini and make out on this desk, I'd be happy to tell you. Behind the window three women had a twitch in their eyes while a super pervert wisely moved apart from them. Inside the room Ibiki rolled his eyes at the man's words. Prisoner always did one of four things before the interrogation actually got underway. They either played silent, started running their mouths, try and turn the tables on him, or try and goad the interrogator into killing them. What he had just heard wasn't even very original compared to some of the other things he heard on a weekly basis. Normally Ibiki would have tried to keep the man talking. Occasionally he got some form of entertainment from the ones who spoke the language of bullshit fluently. Unfortunately he had a very specific piece of information that needed to be plucked from the man's mind. Pity that Anko had been forced to head off into the forest of death to find both one of her summons and Genin team. The eccentric woman could have probably easily distracted Arashi given what the man's words implied. Cracking his neck from side to side Ibiki placed his hands behind his back, sorry. I don't smile, and the T&I department are tragically suffering from a lack of busty blonde and red-haired recourses. Arashi tilted his head back and groaned as he was denied seeing one of his fantasies play out at his requests once again. Looking dejectedly up at the room's only light on the ceiling, the Yandaimi Hokage look-alike sighed. You ready to start seriously answering my questions now? Only if you tell me what the point is for me to answer you. Retorted the blonde-haired man. Locking gazes with his interrogator Arashi's face morphed to one of disinterest, I mean let's get real here. What could a very special cage bunshin have to possibly tell you guys? What did you say? I happen to be a clone of the original, and prejudice be damned, I am proud to be one. I can use my father's Hiroshin no Jutsu, flying thunder god technique, and I beat a Jinchuriki who was using two tails worth of power alone. Knowing that, is anyone really that surprised that the original left me behind for Kakashi and the others to find? How do I know you're not bluffing this? Ibiki questioned disbelievingly. Whether you believe me or not doesn't matter at the moment. Arashi brought his hands up his hands up to reveal a pair of shackles covering his forearms and preventing him from moving his hands to form hand seals. On each shackle was a seal with the kanji for, lost, written in the center. These are one of the seals made by my father, correct? On the other side of the window Jiraiya ground his teeth at the word, Father. Liar. Minato only ever had one child in his life. And he is the one you put in that hospital bed. Back in the room Ibiki stiffly nodded his head in the affirmative. With that action Arashi smirked and closed his eyes. Almost immediately the shackles were covered in a reddish glow before the seal was burned away and the shackles broken. All five Konoha Nin felt their eyes widen in shock as the prisoner began rubbing the parts of his arms where the skin appeared to be lightly burned. Not looking up from his actions Arashi began speaking again, 
every seal master is unique. Their seals are always different from the ones made by others, even if the seals are made for the same purpose. Because of that, each seal has a unique weakness that can be exploited. That action however requires intimate knowledge of the seal in question, something that only the person who created them can know. Dad taught me everything I know about Fuinjutsu, and I know everything about his seals. Looking back up at Ibiki Arashi smiled before crossing his arms, I also don't happen to be your average bunshin. The original me has this habit of taking different jutsu and find a way to expand upon them. The cage bunshin in this case, when he made me he performed something he calls Shinzui cage bunshin no jutsu, life blood shadow clone jutsu. That jutsu creates a perfect clone of the user, solid, equal chakra reserves and capacity, individuality, mental capabilities, experience, and durability. Any Shinzui cage bunshin is fully sentient, and can take as much punishment as the original. Ibiki looked truly intrigued by the technique, sounds like you have a lot of free time on your hands if you made a jutsu like that. Arashi began flexing his fingers to force blood to flow through them before continuing, true, but then again the captain wasn't part of any village for the close to seven years. But how about we get back on topic now? The clones only dispel if they are killed like any other shinobi. The bad news is that when he created that the captain created a double-edged sword. For all its benefits and uses the jutsu is even more dangerous than ordinary cage bunshin. First off, as an example, if someone were to pierce my heart with a kunai and I dispelled, then the pain would be felt by the original just the same. But that's not the biggest downside. You see, Shinzui clones can exist anywhere from a day to a few weeks, all depending on how much chakra the captain uses to make one us. That time frame however, is taken away from the life of the user. When the captain created me, he lost a week of his lifespan. With a puff of smoke two figures appeared in the room behind Ibiki. When the smoke dissipated a pair of stone-faced Sanin stood next to each other. Smiling at the newcomers the Shinzui clone waved once before making a hidden hand seal. He felt a splitting headache followed by a wave of nausea. Slowly he became aware of the fact that half of his body was very wet. He required several minutes to realize that the sound of haggard and shallow breathing echoing around him was his own. Hesitantly a pair of heavy eyelids opened and then closed, revealing a pair of somewhat dulled electric blue eyes. Where, am I? What happened to me? You allowed your opponent to control the flow of battle. You became a toy to him. Eyes opening wide at the deep and malicious voice, Naruto flipped himself over. He looked around his surroundings while trying to regain control of his breathing. A massive cage was in front of him, a paper seal attached to the bars. Murky water, walls, and pipes surrounded him. My mind, I'm back here with the fox. How pitiful and embarrassingly weak a container you are right now. There are moments when I feel that letting you die and being rid of you and your foolishness would be worth waiting the centuries needed reform. The voice was followed by a deep guttural laugh that reminded the teen just what he kept away from his precious people. The monster that could kill them all with the slightest movement of its nine tails. A creature that could never die, or just disappear, something that could only be imprisoned. A pair of blood-red eyes opened from behind the cage and a massive head came into view. Crimson and orange fur seemed to glow a pale color as more of the massive form began to reveal itself. Shakily rising to his feet, Naruto glared hatefully at the massive beast that was the reason for so many terrible things. The biju that many people in Konoha believed him to be, simply trapped in the shell of a human. The demon that nearly destroyed the village, and killed his parents. The reason why he was sacrificed on the very day of his birth. Any chance at a normal start to his life gone, and all because of what was looking at him from behind the cage. His burden, his curse, his prisoner, his responsibility. When he could finally stand on his own two feet Naruto wanted nothing more than to finally destroy the Kyubi himself. Regrettably the best he could do was to survive and make sure it was trapped in that cage. Knowing that Naruto put on a taunting smile before opening his mouth, keep talking you overgrown fur ball. After all that's almost all you can do anyway, being sealed inside a weak body and whatnot. If I'm so weak, what does that say about how powerful your chakra really is? Surprisingly the fox did not react at all to the jab by its jailer. Leave. It said and exerted its control over the prison created by the seal to contain its power. 
Immediately the blonde teen disappeared and the legendary Kyubi growled lowly as it could still detect another presence. You yet remain here, even after my host has left. The most powerful of the biju remained silent as it listened for a response. Slowly it smiled widely and showed its teeth. I see. Very well. Let us, speak. Flowers. He smelled flowers. Why were there flowers in his mindscape wait? The fox pushed him out, so that meant that he must be awake. But why didn't it feel like he was outside in a forest? He felt like he was someplace indoors, and on something very comfortable. The last thing he remembered was Arashi placing something over his heart, then feeling some of the worst pain he had ever experienced, and then seeing the Kyubi's ugly face. Wait, why did the air feel very cool, and why did he hear humming? His nose picked up another scent. It smelled very familiar, and brought bad memories to the forefront of his mind. He couldn't smell much of anything aside from the faint trace of flowers. He began piecing what he knew together slowly, feeling his mind move sluggishly at the same time. He was on top of something decently comfortable, the air felt cooled and smelled like disinfectant. Naruto stopped trying to figure out where he was at that point. The moment his nose determined what why the air seemed so empty to scent his eyes opened. Hospitals and Naruto never went well together. It wasn't even how on one or two visits members of the staff had tried to put him in a coma, or how that he was always the last person seen by a doctor no matter how badly he needed it. No, Naruto despised hospitals because they were always boring, boring colors, boring decorations, boring food, and usually boring people attending to him. On second thought, why was he even thinking in the first place? Hospital. Bad. Leave. Find ramen. Those five words were all he needed to have running through his mind right then. Behind closed eyelids he noticed an outline getting closer. Two and a half years of training under one of the Sanin paid off in that moment, as Naruto launched himself off the hospital bed and at the approaching hospital staff. Unfortunately he failed to take into account the fact that most of the people who worked in the hospital were highly trained medical ninja, because as he opened his eyes he saw an incoming slap aimed at his face. Reacting, Naruto grabbed the arm attached to the hand and swung it to the right. What he did not see was that the figure was on the left of his hospital bed, and when he pulled the person's body fell on top of him. Eyes blinking rapidly to regain his vision Naruto saw a pair of annoyed and narrowed green eyes. Very close green eyes. With a feeling of dread Naruto slowly drew his head back and looked over just who he had pulled down. It was a woman, his age and looked familiar who was wearing a short purple shirt, an open purple skirt and from what he could tell thanks Aero Senen for making me learn this a black short skirt, and fishnet shorts. More fishnet was placed over her elbows and knees. Waist long blonde ponytail with bangs covering the right side of her face. His cheeks developed a faint blush when he noticed that her chest was almost pressed down against his own. Smiling sheepishly he forced out an awkward laugh as he realized what he had done to one of his friends, a uh, hyeno. Long time no see ha, huh? ha ha ha, he unconsciously moved his arm up to rub the back of his head, one of his usual habits whenever he felt he had done something stupid. Unfortunately something blocked his hand from moving all the way, or rather a pair of somethings. Instinctively he squeezed, Ino went wide-eyed and she moaned lowly as her eyes became lidded and a red blush spread over her facial features. Crap. As Eno's eyes snapped open a second later they seemed to hold a mix of rage, embarrassment, and pleasure. But at that moment all Naruto cared about was the rage, and then the fear as he remembered numerous times when Jiraiya had done things that weren't as bad as what he had done before being pummeled by angry women. Mentally Naruto made a note, if he survived considering how mad the Yamanaka heir looked, that he needed to get back at him for corrupting him with the older man's perverted ways. Staff Patients, and visitors alike all looked around curiously as a loud cry of pain followed by similar cries and begging resounded throughout the entire hospital. In his bed, and unable to move, Hitaki Kakashi merely blinked once before making his famous eye smile, well then how about that? Looks like Naruto's met a girl and felt her up considering what he's screaming about. With a box of her favorite dango sitting in her lap Anko smirked, remembering our first date or we. That wasn't a date. That was you trying to take advantage of me the day after I left Anbu and went to a bar for the first time in years. Did you honestly think a 16-year-old could outdrink a man on a mission to drown his sorrows? First of all, 
you never drank before then in your life. I thought I'd be able to match you at least because of that. And secondly, it is so a date because you felt me up, paid for my meal, took me to your place, we laughed, we drunk, and woke up with crazy hangovers the next day with you on the couch and me on your bed. Anko said, finishing it up with an annoyed tone. Kakashi's lone eye moved to look at her, and how many nights have you been to my place and still had clothes on the next morning after that? The snake mistress pointed up at the ceiling, and the cyclops followed. Really? Huh? I thought it was less. You do remember it took me over four years to get us to the friends with benefits part of the relationship, right? Anko, are you implying this entire relationship is all because of you? Considering how you're only on time for our dates, then yeah. I'm pretty sure it's all me. So, where to after I get the go-ahead to leave this place? It's been a month since you actually spent more than a few days in the village, seeing as how Hokage-sama loves giving you the good missions. I'll get back to you later, but heads up. I expect reparation in the form of having a one-eyed manservant for a full 24 hours after you set one foot out of this hospital. So, Dango shops first followed by helping you scare your genin during team exercises and finishing up with a romantic dinner at the most expensive restaurant in Kanahagakur. Yup. Nara Shikamaru, Chunin of Kanahagakur and Nara Clan Air, stood outside of hospital room 352A. The laziest man in the village remained where he was and stared at the door with his hands hanging loosely at his sides. Shikamaru had proven many times that he was gifted with an incredibly high level of intelligence and level-headedness. The pineapple-haired Chunin had used both to come to the decision that he would not enter the room at the moment. He had a feeling that if he were to do so that his life would be cut tragically short. Stay still, shouted a feminine voice before being followed by a shout of fear. Shikamaru sighed before shaking his head. Ino, the genius thought silently. No, the voice was masculine and was accompanied by the sound of glass breaking. As that voice reached his ears the lazy Chunin immediately looked at the door wide-eyed. Naruto, what is he doing? If you don't stay still I swear to Kami-sama I'll kill you. Shikamaru reflexively winced at the tone in his blonde-haired teammate's voice. It was the tone of voice she used right before either he or Choji found themselves on the ground and in pain. He pitied Naruto at that moment. You're trying to kill me right now. Yep, that confirms just what's going on in there. Well, at least he's already in a hospital. Only because you groped me you bastard. The Nara clan heir felt both of his eyebrows rise up in shock and disbelief. What the hell was going on in there? I didn't mean to, honest. It's just, you were right on top of me and I just reacted. Reacted, you call pulling me on top of you, and then groping my SA reaction. They were in the way. Shikamaru heard a loud scream of vengeful fury before he instinctively ducked his head down. No sooner had he done this when a kunai broke through the small window of the door and passed the area where his head had just been. Naruto, what did you do? Getting Ino to calm down when she's like that is going to be such a drag. And I'm the only one here who can do it. It wasn't the first time a former member of Team 10 had been called down to the hospital. Occasionally someone would say or do something that would push his friend off the deep end and start something truly frightening and only one the Yamanaka's friends or parents could prevent her from killing some poor soul. In this case it was one of Shikamaru's older friends from the ninja academy, Uzumaki Naruto, who just so happened to be uninformed about what not to say or do in the presence of the blonde Kunoichi. What, you were practically pressing them up against me? Oh man, that is so not good. The Chunin quickly forced the door open in time to see Naruto just barely dodge a chakra-enhanced roundhouse kick from Ino. The blonde-haired village prankster quickly made his way to the other side of his hospital room, trying to put as much distance between him and his fellow blonde. Spinning around to face him Ino growled before reaching into the single pouch she had on her. The kunoichi pulled out a trio of sanban needles before moving to launch them at the hospital gown-clad Naruto. Knowing Ino's preference of poison-tipped sanban, Shikamaru quickly made the rat hand seal. Molding his chakra Shikamaru called out, Kajmane no Jutsu, Shadow Possession Jutsu. His shadow extended outward before splitting in two and going for the two blondes. The lazy Chunin mentally patted himself on the back when the Jutsu caught them just before Ino had thrown her Sanban. Naruto, who had closed his eyes when he saw the needles, 
opened them halfway and saw that both he and Ino were unable to move. It was then that he finally realized that Shikamaru had entered the room for the first time. Moving his eyes to look in the direction of his friend, the Uzumaki smiled. At the same time his female counterpart was busy glaring daggers at her flak jacket wearing teammate. Shikamaru slowly brought both of his hands down and slid them into his pockets before opening his mouth, okay. Slowly, and clearly, would one of you troublesome blondes please tell me what is going on? Immediately the two opened their mouths at once and began to speak a mile a minute. The Nara brought a single hand up to silence the barrage of explanations, an action the other two were forced to do as well. As the silence returned he decided to try a different approach, okay, I probably could have said that better. This time I want Eno, and only Eno, to start talking. An emerald green eye looked at the prankster on the other side of the room before narrowing, a while ago Naruto and the others got back to the village while I was here in the hospital. The baka over there, Naruto looked ready to fire off a retort before he caught Shikamaru's own stare, was in some kind of coma. Tsunade-sama called my dad in to see if there was any way to wake him up. After a few hours of nothing my dad left to take a break and asked me to stay in the room in case he woke up. I was changing the plants in the room because it was so plain and ordinary when he woke up. And then he grabbed my arm, pulled me onto the bed with him, and groped me like the pervert he is. Naruto decided that he had kept silent long enough, oi, I wasn't thinking straight when I woke up, and it's not like you didn't like it. To the great surprise of the Nara era genjutsu of a fire appeared behind her visible eye, the same kind that appeared in the eyes of Gai and Lee. Although something told the Chunin that if either man saw it they would say that it had nothing to do with the flames of youth, at all, what did you say? Oh man, this is bad. Come on Naruto, show that you have some sense in that head of yours and be quiet. Unfortunately the Uzumaki seemed not to have been aware of Shikamaru's silent pleading, you closed your eyes and moaned. And if I've learned anything from Aero Senen, it's that girls only do that if they like something. Ino growled in the back of her throat before she tried to break free of the shadow possession. Shikamaru widened his eyes in shock when he felt his hold over the Yamanak weaken. Bringing his hands back up to form the rat hand seal once again he began to strengthen his jutsu. While he focused more on his teammate the Nara purposely loosened his hold on Naruto, who quickly began relieving the slight stiffness in his body. Turning to look at the spiky-haired blonde he said in a deadpan voice, Naruto. Run, now. Naruto blinked twice before looking from the red-faced Ino to the straining face of Shikamaru. The blonde genin didn't need more than an instant to realize what was happening. Shooting a grateful look at the shadow user Naruto quickly ran out the door. Ino cried out in anger as the teen made his escape, Shika if you don't let me go right now I'll make sure that tomorrow you won't even remember how to get dressed in the morning. The Nara clan air gulped before refocusing on his jutsu. Naruto you owe me for this. What a drag this all is. Naruto ran down the halls of the hospital with the sole thought of finding somewhere to hide until Shikamaru managed to convince Ino not to murder him. Already the genin was halfway to the top of the hospital and there was no sign of pursuit. He soon came to a sudden halt however as he realized two very important things. The first was that he had nothing on but the hospital gown. The second was that he was an idiot for running when he could just open a window and walk down the side of the hospital. After palming his face and muttering under his breath Naruto's head darted left and right. Damn it, he mentally groaned. There weren't any windows on either side of the hallway, just a bunch of rooms. His electric blue eyes were soon locked on the nearest door to his right. He knew from experience that most hospital rooms had at least one decent sized window. The few times he had been in the hospital before he had tried to escape by using them, and he knew that the windows were usually left unlocked. If there was anyone in whatever room he decided to use then he was reasonably certain they wouldn't mind at all. The only question was whether or not he could manage to stick to the walls. He still felt slightly disorientated which was unusual. Under normal circumstances he would have felt good as new. Then again it might have had something to do with the QB sealed within him. The fox hadn't been overly criticizing during their last meeting, if anything it seemed uncaring. Maybe it had decided to let him get back to normal on his own as some kind of twisted lesson. Naruto narrowed his eyes, that would be something the demon would do after all. Regardless, 
The point was that he wasn't a hundred percent certain that he wouldn't just fall down to the ground if he tried walking up the building. So, it's either risk Eno catching up to me, or chance falling down the side of a hospital. On the one hand, Eno wants to kill me. On the other, the fall could break a lot of bones in my body. But didn't Sakura Chan say that Eno had some lessons from Ba Chan? The image of a broken and bleeding Jiraiya with an annoyed Tsunade standing over him came to mind, followed by one of him and Eno in their positions respectively. A shiver went up the blonde spine at the possibility, walking up the side of a wall where a fall could end with all the bones in my body broken it is. Naruto walked to the nearest room close to him and reached to open the door. Turning the knob the door swung open seamlessly and he walked in. Turning around he stuck his head out to check if Eno had managed to catch up at all. To his relief there was no sign at all of the green-eyed blonde in sight. That was when he heard someone cough from inside the room, Naruto. What are you doing in my room? Hearing the familiar voice Naruto slowly turned around to look. Sure enough the sight of a silver-haired, one-eyed, Jonin greeted him. He smiled nervously at his Jonin sensei before a hand went up to rub the back of his head, Hi Kakashi sensei. Uh, this might sound weird but, can I use your window? The lone eye stared curiously back at him for a moment before curving upwards. Taking the familiar eye smile as a yes Naruto quickly thanked the Hitaki before moving. He was almost halfway to the window before he noticed that the room had three occupants at the moment. It was the smell of non-hospital food that got him to actually look in the direction of his former teacher's bed. Light brown pupil-less eyes, violet spiky ponytail, an overcoat, orange miniskirt, and a mesh bodysuit ending at her thighs, Mitarashi Anko. A stick of dango was halfway to the woman's mouth when she realized that Naruto was staring. She blinked once before giving him a single wave of the hand, long time no see brat. The woman soon returned her attention to the meal in her other hand. Naruto shrugged and turned to open the window when he did a double take. Eyes widening and his mouth opening and closing rapidly, the blonde weakly raised an arm and pointed at her. Kakashi, noticing the state of his student, looked curiously between Naruto and Anko, am I missing something here? Naruto immediately regained control of himself and looked at the man before asking dumbly, Kakashi sensei. Why is the crazy snake lady in your room eating dango? Anko, I think it would be pretty obvious for you to see Naruto, even with your legendary denseness. Everyone gets hungry sooner or later, and she has an obsession with dumplings. It took all the self control he had learned during his training for Naruto to keep himself from dropping face first to the floor. With a noticeable twitch in his left eye, the Uzumaki shot his sensei a dry look No, Kakashi sensei, I mean, what is she doing in your room? The Hitaki blinked innocently at his loudmouthed student's words. Mentally he decided to play around with the blonde's limited patience a bit more. The longer he stretched these games out the more enjoyable the reactions he could get. Putting on his eye smile once again Kakashi continued to play with the team, the hospital does provide every patient's room with a very comfortable chair Naruto. I assume she got tired of standing up and decided to take a seat and enjoy the nice chair. Konoha's snake mistress quickly caught on to the hidden game playing out right in front of her. Hitaki Kakashi sure was fond of the whole, underneath the underneath, thing. Smirking she decided to join her boyfriend in messing around with the blonde haired Jenin with her own brand of teasing, it's perfect for relaxing for just a few minutes. Of course, you wouldn't know anything about that would you? This time Naruto turned to respond to Anko, what are you talking about, I totally know how to relax. The woman had on a look of mock shock, really. I just assumed that since you can't seem to stay still for more than a few seconds. I think I once saw him go a whole five minutes doing anything during our mission to Nami no Kuni, Kakashi quipped from his stationary position while mentally laughing at the look of indignation on Naruto's face. Kakashi sensei, the Uzumaki whined pitifully with a slightly hurt expression on his face. It quickly disappeared in time for him to scrunch up his face in annoyance, why are you two picking on me at the same time? Anko rolled her eyes while Kakashi's eye smile still remained firmly in place, Naruto, we are not picking on you. It's just that I'm more afraid of her reactions than I am of yours. Um, what, don't worry, not understanding something doesn't mean it's impossible to understand. Naruto was tempted to give in to the appealing urge of pulling at his blonde hair. 
Why couldn't they just tell him what he wanted to know? Sure they were all ninja, and the oldest of them was so secretive he kept a mask under a mask, and the woman was certifiably insane, and, the blonde was certain that if he had said any of what he was thinking out loud he would have felt very foolish. With a low groan the teen felt his shoulders slump, they could keep whatever they didn't want him to know between themselves. Never mind, I don't really need to know what snake lady's doing here. It's not like you're dating or anything right. Awkward silence. More silence accompanied by the sounds of shifting bedspreads and whistling. No way. There was no chance at all right. Hesitantly Naruto opened his mouth to ask, Kakashi sensei. Crazy snake lady. Enko stopped whistling and turned to look at Kakashi. Can I kill him to keep it secret? To Naruto's growing sense of horror the masked Jonin seemed to consider it. To his immense relief the man shook his head in a, no, answer. That relief quickly disappeared with the next spoken words, no, but you can if people start hearing about it before we tell everyone ourselves. The Tokabetsu Jonin childishly made a show of stomping her foot and pouting in disappointment. A second later three eyes moved to stare directly at Naruto. The teenage Jinchuriki reacted by bringing his hands up to try and ward off any attempts at bodily harm and looked fearfully back at Anko, don't worry. I swear I won't say a word, honest. Seemingly satisfied with the statement Kakashi I smiled once again, all right. We'll hold you did Naruto. Now, go away. Sighing in relief the blonde did just that and walked right out of the room, carefully closing the door behind. Kakashi moved his up from the bed and held up three fingers before counting down. With one finger left Naruto quickly opened the door and moved his head into the room with a wide smile. By the way, if you buy me some ramen Kakashi sensei you won't need to keep your secret by scaring me. Dejectedly the Hitaki let his arm drop, no more than five bowls Naruto. And you have to bring me something to eat next time you drop by. But you already have a girlfriend who brought food. Correction. I have a girlfriend who I think loves Dango more than me, and didn't bring food for me. The blonde nodded his head in satisfaction before complying. He felt a pair of eyes turn their focus on him as soon as Naruto had left. Curiously, he moved his head to look in the direction of the younger woman. Anko had crossed both arms over her chest, he silently bemoaned that, and looked just a tad insulted. She had a slight grin to her face and he could see that familiar mischievous gleam, that's not true Kakashi. You're a little bit more important than my dango, but just a little. The Hitaki was torn between feeling glad or annoyed that he was only a little more highly rated than dumplings. Outside the room Naruto was halfway down the hallway when he stopped. He cried out in exasperation when he realized that he had forgotten to take the window out of the room as per his plan. He was lowly chewing himself out for forgetting to do so when he picked up on a noticeable amount of nearby killing intent. Stiffing immediately the Uzumaki slowly turned his head to look down the other end of the hallway. He whimpered in fear. Ino however, dragging a babbling and drooling Shikamaru by his hair behind her, smiled evilly. Emergency AN. I would just like to prevent any confusion here. For the record, I did state that when alone Namikaze Arashi would be written as Namikaze Naruto. He's only Arashi when someone not from his dimension is at the scene. If it's just him, Ateri, or Ateri's Kisame, then he'll be refereed to as Naruto. His blood shadow clones are always Arashi though. Savvy. Closing parenthesis. Namikaze Naruto stood in the center of a large open field. Just half a mile away from the field he could see a large and bustling Hai no Kuni port city harbor. The Namikaze could also hear the gentle and relaxing sound of waves slamming up against rocks, and felt a light breeze pass over him. His trained eyes identified more than two dozen familiar shipping companies and more than three that he was certain did not exist in his world. Naruto closed his eyes and took in a deep breath of air. It was exactly the same as in his world. The smell of the ocean mixed with that of civilization. Opening his eyes he smiled at the busy harbor, and enjoyed the moment. Now that he was alone he could stop using an alias. Boats and ships of all sizes, along with their crews and dock hands, jockeying for a chance to enter or leave with empty or fully loaded cargo holds. The sight brought back fond memories of his childhood. Times when his family would be able to go outside the walls of Kanahagakur and be normal, well as normal as a cage and his family could be anyway considering that they always had an Anbu guard detail accompanying them. He looked around the field for the fifth time with a quarter hour. 
The only difference was that there was no house within the field at all. His family had always had house situated near the port city of Zauzenjo even after the deaths of his parents. The home wasn't overly expensive, nor did it flaunt the Namikaze's immense wealth. It was, homely and average, the perfect setting for a family to remember not to let their status go to their heads, he met many a member of one of Konoha's clans who let their family name define their very lives. His family's vacation home was also the place where, he had been too young to understand the meaning at the time, he was, made, according to his mother. Naruto failed to suppress the shiver that traveled up along his spine. All right, time to stop thinking about my parents and their sexual interaction that led to my birth. Ah, uh, if ever there were words that should never be in the same sentence, they would be, parents, and, sexual, all the way. Hell, who actually wants to anywhere near the spot they were conceived? The Namikaze closed his eyes and once more inhaled the air surrounding him. He used it as a focal point to put his mind back on track. Naruto had not come to this place so that he could remember much better times, no matter how much he missed them. He had made the decision to visit this place because of what else was left hidden there. Something that he hoped his family in this world as well as his own had in common. The sign he had found thus far would point one towards that conclusion. There was no natural reason for a field this close to a large source of water to be virtually devoid of all plant life, the only thing that grew in the field was grass. The Namikaze could also make out faint markings etched into several well-sized rocks, their symbols worn away long ago. In addition to these he had also found something which he now held in the palms of both hands, one of his father's tripronged kanai. The blade of the Yandaimi Hokage had long since become virtually worthless based on his up-close observations. For starters the ring at the end of the blade was missing. Directly next were the wrappings around the handles, of which only a few torn bits remained. The steel which should have been devoid of many signs of use was riddled with scratches and chipped away fragments. Rust clung to nearly every visible part of the weapon, a clear sign of just how long it had lain there in the dirt forgotten. Tossing it up in the air Arashi held out his left index finger. His father's rusty weapon spun in the air a pitiful three times before falling back downwards. Disgusted by the amount of flaws he was finding in the blade Naruto channeled a minute amount of chakra into his index finger coating the appendage in a light blue, almost purple, glow. The tri-pronged kunai did manage, much to his surprise, to land blade down on the digit. The Namikaze brought up his right hand and grasped at the handle of the weapon. Lifting it up just an inch he ceased the flow of chakra to his finger and swiftly jabbed downwards with the weapon. How, refreshing, he thought while watching a steady flow of red blood pour out from the surprisingly deep cut. To his great shock he had nearly sliced off a chunk of his finger with the jab. The pain was relatively minor and he paid no attention to it. Instead the Namikaze flipped the kunai so that its blade was pointed at his face. He watched his own blood flow down the rusty blade and fall to the ground beneath him. He continued to do so until he smiled widely. Then he started to chuckle. Wow dad, Naruto said while he continued to chuckle, you're cheap even in another dimension. It was a well-known fact that the great Namikaze Minato, the Yandaimi Hokage and his father, was a closet miser. The man was very much a zealot when it came to saving money. His father was very careful in finding the perfect metal for his custom-made kunai that was cheap, easy to maintain, and durable. Still he disliked having to use more than one at a time however. According to the man constant use of the kunai would lead to its sharp edge wearing down, tears to form in the steel, and for the once beautiful weapons to become rusted. And that's, his father's own words, a real waste. That was why he only spent larger amounts of Ryo on a rare alloy used in constructing the three tips of the kunai. Naruto also had a small suspicion that the man was lying about that part. No matter what he did, no matter what he used, none of the Horishin kunai he made after leaving the village was ever as sharp or long-lasting as his father's own. Nevertheless the fact was that only the three tips of the kunai were in good condition while the rest was, well, crap. Soon the spiky-haired blonde man was able to stop chuckling a few moments later. Wiping away at a few tears he had shed seconds earlier his eyes were soon darting around everywhere. The Namikaze heir was looking for one thing specifically as he looked all over the open field. 
It wasn't long before his keen cobalt blue eyes found something in the form of a medium-sized rock. The stone was very unnoticeable upon first glance, just as it was meant to be. Naruto covered the distance quickly with only a few long strides of his legs. Bending down to get a better view the blonde placed his blood-covered left hand, the cut was in the process of healing itself slowly, on the stone. Swiping away at the layer of dirt and grime he was soon looking at a faint etching of the Namikaze clan symbol, a large wave connecting with a massive wind blast. A quarter of a foot above the seal were three small slits in the stone. Smirking he looked down at the tri-pronged kunai still in his right hand. Naruto stood up and moved three meters back away from the rock. After coating the kunai in a layer of his wind chakra and eyeing the three slits for about two seconds more he threw the kunai. The three blade tips of the weapon fully slid up to the handle into the rock. A second after that the rock fell into the earth along with a piece of the surrounding ground. Naruto walked up to the edge to peer down into the newly revealed underground entrance, and then barely managed to twist his body to avoid being skewered by a pair of spikes launching out from the ground. To his annoyance one of the shoulder pads on the borrowed Suna flak jacket had been taken clean off by one of the spikes. Damn, forgot that mom probably left a few surprises behind to mess with dad. His mother was a prankster of the highest caliber, but she only ever did something like this for his father. He was the only man whose reflexes were fast enough that there was no chance of him ever being injured, just scared out of his skin. Not even Naruto held a candle when it came to speed and his father. That was the reason why the man only needed a handful of his custom kunai to take out dozens of Iwa Shinobi and Kunoichi in a single hour. The only time he could remember matching his father in a contest of speed was during their infrequent spars after he had made his deal with the QB. Knowing full well that there were almost certainly more traps waiting for him Naruto sighed before taking the first step. He froze up without warning and felt a familiar tingle in the back of his mind. Hum, I wonder just what that clone I left in Konoha did just now. With my luck he's probably done something to tick off both the Sanin there. If he weren't me I'd call him an idiot. The Shinzui cage Bunshin sneezed without warning. His sneeze forced him to throw his cup of coffee into the air. That cup of caffeine landed perfectly atop the spiky white-haired pervert that was Jiraiya of the Sanin. His sneeze also forced an out of its slug princess to snap back to attention and rapidly move to sit straight in her seat. The action caused her ample bosom to jiggle. Jiraiya's eyes caught sight of this and he whipped his head to stare at the them. That was when the hot coffee-filled cup fell off from his head and spilled all over that of the goddamn Hokage. Tsunade growled. Jiraiya rushed to the far side of the room in terror. Oh shit, Arashi clone said when he realized that Jiraiya and he were in grave danger. The Arashi clone gulped in worry before quickly grabbing the pen within reach of the Hokage. The clone swiftly wrote down his signature before pushing his seat back and leaving it. Turning to face the other man in the room he jumped out forward to him. Grabbing the man by the shoulders he quickly used a shunshun and both men vanished in an explosion of water. They reappeared two blocks southwest of the village intelligence division's department building. Taking a step back from the white-haired pervert both men let out long sighs of relief. The Arashi clone and Toad Sage suddenly stiffened as they felt waves of killing intent roll over them. So, Arashi clone turned to look at Jiraiya who had turned a bit pale, I have to visit the Gaki and Kakashi at the hospital anyway. Wana, you know, tag along. Arashi clone was about to answer when a loud scream of fury reached the pair's ears, followed by something flying out of the roof of the intelligence building. Tentatively he looked over his shoulder for a moment before turning to look at Jiraiya. Does she know you want to visit them? Jiraiya nodded. She'll head there first. We need to hide out somewhere for a while. Kid's apartment. Huh, Naruto's apartment. She'd never think to look for us there, and I know where he keeps his spare set of keys good a place as any. Jiraiya gripped the shoulder of the clone and they both disappeared in a puff of smoke. Ten minutes later a rashy clone was looking through Naruto's refrigerator for something to eat. The clone had yet to eat since it had been created and, since it was an exact copy, needed food to survive just like its creator. It soon became apparent however that Naruto needed to really spend some of his pay on a food run, what the hell is this? Flipping the channels on Naruto's television while sitting on the only chair in the apartment Jiraiya turned his head, what the hell is what? 
The Namikaze clone slammed the fridge shut before walking towards the super pervert. The apartment was very small with only three rooms, the living room, the bathroom, and the bedroom. The kitchen was on the far left corner of the living room and there was a balcony on the opposite side. It was a far cry from the mansion that someone of Naruto's lineage deserved to say the least. Arashi clone came to a halt beside the Sanin. He was holding a carton of milk curiously in both hands, searching for something. Jiraiya had an idea of just what he was looking for but decided to play dumb as the clone opened his mouth, this is a carton of milk. Yes, I'm not old enough that I can't see boy. Ignoring that, responded the blonde-haired clone. He flipped the milk carton to look at the bottom, I can't find an expiration date anywhere on this thing. Feeling particularly mischievous Jiraiya simply waved the man off. You really think the Gaki would be dumb enough to keep spoiled milk in his refrigerator? Arashi clone gave him a blank look, do you really think I'm dumb enough to fall for that? Good point, of course, I made it, arrogant aren't you? I prefer to think of it as me exercising my well-deserved confidence to speak the truth as I see it. That a yes, yes, don't drink the milk, poisoned, wouldn't surprise me, this common, no. Kid was only in the village a little while before he had to go on that mission to Suna. So, I took him on training trip that lasted two and a half years. It isn't hard to figure out. This has been here, like I said, wouldn't surprise me. Arashi clone stared at the milk carton another few seconds before tossing it in the direction of the balcony. The carton sailed over the railing and down to the streets of Kanahagakur. This is disgusting. Jiraiya sensed that something had changed in the young clone's young man's mood. Turning off the TV he set down the remote before turning to level a serious look at his companion, you're not talking about the milk are you? The clone turned to look in the direction of the white-haired man, he shouldn't be made to live here. And just where do you think he should be living? The Namikaze clan compound, Arashi clone said without a hint of hesitance. If Jiraiya hadn't been questioning the man for hours straight he knew that answer would have seemed very left field. As it was it made perfect sense that the clone would say that. Jiraiya you know that he deserves that place more than I do. He was born here, he's the son of the this Konoha's Yandaimi. Naruto's does so much for this village and he doesn't even know half the secrets surrounding him. The Sanin stood up and towered over the younger man's blood clone. His stare was heated and showed that he did not like being spoken to in the way that the clone was doing so, he doesn't live there, because it was Minato's wish. You expect me to believe that my father would want Naruto to live a normal life? Look at you, you were hiding things from me and Tsunade, don't think we couldn't tell. You carry yourself like someone who's lost a lot of things, you've had to become a nuke to survive. Anbu Black Ops Captain at 15. Great job. But how much of yourself did you have to kill to get there? What have you done that gives you nightmares, that you regret? The Arashi clone narrowed cobalt blue eyes at the older man and his hands turned into fists. Jiraiya continued on knowing that he wouldn't be interrupted, you're from another dimension. You're the son of a cage. Look where your life is at now. What has knowing just who you are gotten you? Naruto's been treated poorly, and that's as much my fault for not being there as it is the stupidity of the villagers. But look at what he has right now, what he's done. He mastered the Rasengan in just over a single week, learned Cage Bunshin overnight, fought off another Jinchuriki who had given control of his body to his Biju and Wan. He wants to bring a shinobi back who put a Chidori through his chest three years ago, and considers him to still be his best friend. Jiraiya watched as the clone's eyes briefly flashed a demonic red. The Sanin blinked in surprise at that. It was just like Naruto when he was using some of the Kyuubi's chakra. Could that mean that he was also a Jinchuriki? The Toad Sage was so caught up in the sight that he barely noticed that the clone was speaking, don't pretend Jiraiya. You, don't, no, us, everything you just said means nothing to me. If anything, they just mean that Naruto could have done a hell of a lot better knowing who he was and you know it. The Sanin narrowed his eyes, how do you know him better than someone who spent years teaching him? Maybe I don't, the clone closed the distance between them in an instant, but I know as much as someone who abandons the son of his prized pupil for thirteen years. I am going to enjoy tossing you around tomorrow, and I'll enjoy making you wish were allowed to kill. The two men glared daggers at one another as the conversation died down. 
The silence was broken when they both heard a light knock on the door, Jiraiya-sama. It was the Sanin in question who broke their staring contest first to turn at the door, Shizum. Tsunade-sama is going to debrief Kakashi now, she's cooled down and wants you to be there. All right, just give me, here he turned to look back at the clone. Or rather the empty air where the clone had been seconds earlier. Actually let's just go. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.